three British fellows are going to talk about our likes, loves and loathings within the tabletop RPG hobby. And today we're going to be talking about finding the fun and what keeps us coming back to RPGs straight after the music. Okay, guys, so we were chatting a bit before we came on to the stream and we're saying it might be a good idea to just give a sort of a brief rundown of how we got into the hobby in the first place. Just a bit of background, so I don't know if either of you guys wants to go first. Go on, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll break the ice. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way I started, um, as a kid, I used to play with toy soldiers and for those in the UK remember Airfix, uh, H-O-0-0 little packets of um, plastic soldiers and they did plastic tanks. And uh, where I lived at the time, uh, we had a model shop and the only thing they did was uh, uh, plastic models and uh, railway sets. So you could go in there and they'd have packs and packs of these little plastic soldiers. And that's how I started, like a kid, throwing marbles and pencils and stuff like that uh, to knock them down. And then in 1977, uh, when well, I was in WH Smith's, which is a, a bookseller in the UK, they had a book on wargaming by um, Patrick Stevens. And there were little books uh, and had sex, um, on different subjects. And one of them was on World War II wargaming. So that's how I started. I uh, started with World War II wargaming, uh, Napoleonics. And then I'm still not sure how I got into role playing, um, but I seem to remember my cousin, who's a few years older than me, he was away at boarding school and he mentioned something about a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Well, back in those days, you couldn't find it in in, uh, in shops or anything like that. So um, I think I found out about it from White Dwarf magazine, because White Dwarf back in the early sort of uh, 80s did all sorts of stuff. It just didn't do all games workshop stuff. And up to, uh, I think it's number 93, they covered all sorts of stuff. So I must have bought basic D&D box set um, mail order, because there's no other way I could have got it. Um, and that's how I got into D and D. We had a group of about twelve people sat around the table, played uh, that, and then we moved on to advanced D and D. And then, um, in when I was twenty, I got full time work, and like many others, uh, I left the hobby altogether. Uh, came back a few years later when I'd moved to a different uh, area where I live now, and I was reading um, War Game Miniature War Games magazine. And someone set, was setting up a gaming club in the area. So three of us met up, set up a gaming club. And there we started back playing war games. And it was like that for a few years. Uh, one of the lads turned up in the late 90s with board games. Um, and it was a very early board game called El Grande, which was like nothing I'd ever played before. It's like a, an area game. There's no dice rolling at all. It's um, a very clever game. And we got into, got into board games. And um, so... My hobby then was wargaming. I had a, um, a website which I ran for 17 years, which had, uh, posted free wargames rules on there that people could download and link to. And then, oh, seven or eight years ago, I just got fed up with wargaming. And I think the problem was I was running the website for 17 years. I was also uh, an editor of a wargames magazine called The Journal for the Society of 20th Century Wargamers. And that took up about two years of my life with just editing articles, writing articles. And I think I just got fed up with it. And down at my local gaming club, and there were some lads there playing D&D. &D, and I thought, Do you know what? I think it's about time. I had a complete change. Uh, got back into, I had played a few games of D&D uh, &D there. And that was it. I was hooked back on the hobby again. Uh, and all my money, instead of going for board games and war games, was... Um, back to role-playing games. And what surprised me, as I'm sure it did uh, others, was how much the hobby had changed of since the 80s when you had D&D, &D, RuneQuest, Tunnels and Trolls, to suddenly there was thousands of games, uh, independent games, little uh, games. Uh, and it really was opened my eyes up to how much the uh, hobby had um, exploded. And it, I mean, that's like eight, nine years ago. And I think the last two, three years, I probably doubled or tripled in size again. So that's my origin story. A bit different, but uh, there we go. 
Yeah, I mean, I think mine's a little bit similar to, to yours, Pete, in that I, uh, I sort of originally was in in the sort of late eighties. I was involved in a, you know, like the the Games Workshop war games, you know, like Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and uh, stuff like that. And um, we used to we used to, had a couple of friends who were like really into them. We used to paint up the models and whatever and play play Warhammer. And we went to a few of the tournaments up in Nottingham that they used to do at the Games Workshop headquarters. And um, when we went to it, you used to get points for various different categories that all went towards your overall score. And most of the points are for the game and stuff like that, and how, how well you did in the games and stuff. But you also got points for if you came up with like a slightly sort of off kilter sort of like army list, like a creative army list. And if you sort of like had like a little bit of a background with it and everything, you got like a few, and you only got like a handful of points for those. But we went to a few of these uh, these uh, tournaments, and after a while, I realised that I was enjoying creating the background for the army, and like the painting and putting the army together far more than I was enjoying the actual games. And it was about that time when I was sort of mooching around at like, my local game store, I saw Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and so I sat down and I was like flicking through that. And I was like, oh, this seems this seems more my sort of speed. It's more, you know, adventurous. It's more exploring dungeons and it's stuff like that. But it's also a background I know because I'm familiar with like the Warhammer background. So I bought a copy of that and it was the old, um, I think it was the old Hogshead sort of reprint that they did. Bought a copy of that and sort of floated it to my friends. We, we played a few games of it. Easier to get them into it because it was the Warhammer background that we all knew. We played it for a bit and then we went back to, went back to the Wargaming didn't think much more of it and obviously as time went on you know people drift apart as they do and like yourself i was like oh, i'll dig out that i want my fantasy role play see what's going on with that went went to a local club uh walked into my local games shop and as you say there was like a plethora of other games that were available that i'd not been aware of so i think i bought a copy of like the second edition like vampire the masquerade rule book and then there were some people who were running like a, a mind's eye theater like live action sort of version of that in the local area so i went to that for a few years and then i ended up living with a couple of people who were like role players for a bit and we were like playing loads of world of darkness games and pretty much all through the 90s like a lot of sort of angsty teens back then i was playing loads of world of darkness games and then after that i sort of finished and i was a bit sort of like oh you know i'm a bit bit ready for something else now but i still like those games but you know I've, i've sort of done everything i wanted to do with them like yourself, I then started looking around for other games, and it was probably only at that sort of point that I actually started looking at D and D, just because I'd, I'd already always done Warhammer, I'd done a bit of advanced fighting fantasy, I'd gone straight into World of Darkness, and then I was like, oh, you know, you hear people talking about D and D, and I was like, all right, let's have a look at it, and I had like a couple of old A D and D second edition core books that I'd bought, looked into that, I wasn't really taken with A D and D myself, and then gradually as time went on and stuff like the osr games started to become more of a thing because obviously you couldn't get hold of like the originals for like print on demand or anything like that then i sort of started going oh well this seems a bit simpler it seems a bit more the sort of thing i'm looking for and i sort of gradually went more in that direction although i still like my independent games and the slightly more narrative games obviously i i did like i ran loads of fate for a while and then after i'd run that for a bit i was like all right let's try something else and then i sort of went more into the osr stuff and that's pretty much where i am now you know i still i still look around and sort of occasionally find a game that i like the look of like i've just uh, got my vesson kickstarter books come through which i'm looking forward to reading through but yeah that's pretty much how i got into it uh, started off with warhammer fantasy roleplay i sort of segued into all the games and sort of very roundabout way made my way back to D, unlike a lot of people who started with D. so how about yourself then colin yeah, well, I I got into it. I think what piqued my interest was being read The Hobbit in school. So I'd have been around five or six primary school teacher, read The Hobbit, kind of discovered. I, I, I can't think that I knew anything really about fantasy before that because, you know, I'm only five or six. Uh, I, I was drawing. I was doing a lot of drawing. I remember drawing loads of these little stick men and um, Empire Strikes Back was the first uh, film I'd seen at a cinema. And I remember drawing like, you know, the, the Hoff Troopers in the Rebel Hoff Troopers. I, I was drawing these little stick men with little flat caps and the uh, backpacks with a little 
uh, radio aerial thing sticking out the top, and and they would fight these aliens that were basically red stick men with a blue bobble head, and they used to do them as like these. Uh, sort of like a side scrolling game and sit there and do all the sound effects um, kind of like choo, 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 as a, as you're drawing it kind of thing and, and the story would just move across the page and then you go down to the next level and it would carry on and then you more or less came up with a big bad at the end so I feel like I was almost role playing before I knew what role playing was just just through play like naturally like a kid we'd go out in the playground and we'd be we used to go form a big line with our hand on each other's shoulders going going around going who wants to play oh me who and we go around and then you get like a long row of you and once you decided you got enough then you'd like split in the middle and oh you're the Germans we're the British and then then you'd have loads of arguments about who who had been shot and got killed or who was going to be Han Solo and, you know, uh, because you you had your eye on Emma in the other class who was going to be Princess Leia or, you know, and there was all that sort of thing. And so it was kind of like this role playing thing going on. And and then um, I, I think perhaps my teacher picked up on that and she was friends with my mum. Uh, and she ran a game for us and it was uh, Moldvay Basic. Um, and the only reason I knew that, because, of course, none of us, bothered to read who was writing these books at the time you just remember the front cover and um, I remember distinctly the first adventure was as scary as hell and the teacher had just basically reskinned the school where we went to school and turned it into uh, an adventure and, and and populated it with like spooky undead and stuff like that in in place of pupils and teachers and so that was my baptism my my introduction to D&D. And I think we played that f- every week f- for ages up until uh, I moved into infant school. So it, it, no, junior school, it goes, doesn't it? Yeah. So went into junior school and then it was more, I got into the fight and fantasy books, didn't see so much of the teacher, but we remained friends and I started kind of gaming with her son a little bit more. Um, but for whatever reason, we didn't play so much d d but kind of fighting fantasy filled the space. My first book being The Forest of Doom, got really into that. I saw the other books come out. My mate picked up um, uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, and I distinctly remember him picking up Citadel of Chaos. It, I always thought it had a bit of a bit of a rubbishy cover, that one, um, but uh, as a kid, I was intrigued by it. What, you know, why did that cover not look so great as the other two? And I just remember that being a thing because even then, you know, I was in, I was into my art and stuff. Um, and then got a little bit older and was encouraged by another teacher at this point that saw the, the benefit to our literacy and numeracy from like studying and reading these books. And, you know, it's encouraged up into second school, uh, secondary school. And it was during this time of fighting fantasy in the junior school uh, and around about when I was moving into secondary school, so we were about 11, uh, I'd, I'd kind of got a better idea of where these books came from and went to a place called The Guard Room in Dunstable in England. And it was one of these, it was, um, it was done up in a little bit of a mock Tudor kind of style to, the facade, but it was a tiny little shop, you know, it was smaller probably than your average kind of bedroom. I, I, I doubt if it was, I doubt if it was 10 foot square, this shop, it's a sort of like an old real kind of low ceiling, tiny little shop. Um, but once I went in there, there was basically two places you could get your stuff. You either went to Taylor and McKenna, which was a, uh, what became Beaties later on in the UK, or you went to the you went to the guard room, and the guard room was where I started to see miniatures. I picked up my first Citadel miniature. It was a cleric. Picked up a cleric, a dark elf, uh, and a, and a fighter. So they were doing like RPG miniatures, and I think they were like twenty pence each in lead. They might have been fifteen p, and I remember. I remember how scandalous it was when they went up to like 30 pence. <laughs> um, 
And that's where I discovered the likes of um, Dragon Magazine, Dungeon Magazine, the imports that were coming in from the States. And you started to see the AD&D books appeared. Um, my teacher, she picked up the AD&D books. And we kind of did this weird crossover thing where we were kind of playing two games. Um, and I don't think we ever really sorted that out, even, even to the point that a friend of mine bought in the old, um, oh, the what's the D&D basic with a blue, the light blue box? I can't think of the name of it now. It's totally gone out of my head. But we, it, and it only went to, In the expert rules, yeah? No, no, not them ones. Before um, before Moldvay. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the blue box, yeah. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Holmes, Holmes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and I was like looking at that and it was mentioning AD&D and then you had, and it was quite a muddle because of course, you know, they're, they're imports and it's quite new. And Games Workshop at the time was only one shop, and that was down in Hammersmith or wherever. I think it was the Hammersmith one. Um, so, yeah, kind of like muddled muddled through secondary school. And I remember um, picking up Mensa Basic and getting the expert. And once I got the expert, I hardly ever we, – we didn't go much into the basic. We kind of sort of play, played a lot of stuff out of the expert and we were fascinated by the Isle of Dread and the wilderness travel. And we didn't do, we really didn't do so much in the way of dungeoneering as it were. Um, and I remember us getting right into things like the wilderness survival guide much later and the, the dungeoneer survival guide and getting into all this crazy subterranean map making. And, and then of course you come across all the different, systems that were coming out and uh you know we play things like toon and teenage mutant ninja turtles and twilight 2000 and uh top secret si I, in fact i don't know how we found the time we were playing golden he uh, golden heroes champions um loads loads of these like classic games and sprinkling in with that was a bits of um the board games that Games Workshop were coming out. So they were coming out with like the Judge Dread board game and a role-playing game. They were coming out with um, things like Kings and Things, Warrior Knights, Talisman. So Talisman was a massive thing for us and my family. That got us into the whole kind of board gaming thing. Uh, and I don't think my... I don't Once, once my brother had played Talisman, he really got into board games. And I think that that's kind of like carried him through more or less till today um and i say role playing wise probably when i got about college age i didn't i ran out of people to play with went to university didn't get in a group down there and when i came home we were just playing um more war games and getting into war gaming american civil war stuff world war ii war games um full thrust we used to play full thrust with spaceships and I like that because I made the spaceships. We used to scratch build all the spaceships, did a load of that sort of gaming. And that carried on more or less till I got married. And then when I got married, it, it took a bit more of a family turn again. And my brother, see, we was playing El Grande. Loved that game, as Pete mentioned. And um, Settlers of Catan and some of the Euro games were starting to get up a bit of traction. Um, and I was on and off doing other things, working, and then eventually what really got me back into the gaming was Ticket to Ride and um, Pirate's Cove, both Days of Wonder. That led on to Memoir, and then we were playing games, and I think my son and my brother hatched up the idea to get me the 5e starter set when that came out. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, this actually looks like I could run this without too much trouble. And we've been trying to play Descent and other games to replace because I was trying to get that that RPG hit again. So imagining in my mind that it was, oh, yeah, I remember thinking, oh, that took ages and all that. But actually, when I looked at the 5e rules, it was quite streamlined and I just got back into it through there. And I guess what was that probably... Oh, I cut out. Yeah. Yeah. That was about 2014, 2015. 
Um, got back in with Fivey quite heavily at that point. Yeah, looking back at you know how we all started, uh, the one thing that um, sort of uh, comes to my mind is back in those days, you bought the books and you had no idea how to play. You read it and there was no instructions. Uh, you couldn't go on a website or go on YouTube and say, well, how does this work? You looked at anything. Well, I think it works this way. And I'm sure we're playing it completely wrong or completely differently. But the thing is, it just didn't matter, did it? Because you had nah. to muddle through, didn't you? Yeah, it, it was you're with your mates. And this is one of the core things that... Um, uh, I uh, I think of having fun in RPGs is you've got a group of people that you really get on with, and sometimes it, I don't think the uh, the system or the story matters. It's, it's you have you're a bunch of mates uh, or family or whatever sitting around. You're having a good time. You're having uh, fun together, uh, and I think it's a way to to bond to people as well. Uh, role playing because uh, even if you sort of slip out of the role playing aspect of it, you're still having that social aspect around. And when you said about, um, you know, you went to wargaming, I think the difference with wargaming was you only need two people to wargame. If, when you're role-playing, you ideally want three, four or five. And sometimes, well, depending on where you live and your time of your life, it can be difficult to get a, a group of like-minded people that size together. I think it's, I mean, yeah. I, I think um, uh, you're absolutely right. But I think even back in the day when I was like playing Warhammer and I was doing more of the wargaming, I think we were, even like, when we were very young, we were sort of still role playing during that. You know, you'd be like, you'd be like, oh yeah, like these two, like the, the two generals of the armies are, are like facing off in a duel, and you'd be coming up with like a little bit of a story that went along with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, I did that, and in board games. Yeah, the social, the social thing's interesting. I, I think you're right, Pete, because I had my brother, and we were both into gaming. Um, when the other folk, like we had, I, I had issues with a satanic panic shutting down my group, but they couldn't stop me from gaming with my brother. So whilst whenever there was a sort of a, a downturn in interest, we were still able to do the war game or the board game. Um, so, yeah, I think that was definitely a factor for us. My, my original group that I used to war game and uh, role play with, uh, we all split up different ends of the country. And uh, I met them all again recently at, at a, a friend's funeral. And we were chatting about it. And uh, they were so surprised that I was still gaming. I hadn't stopped. Uh, one of them had never, since he left home, uh, going to college, had never done any gaming whatsoever. Uh, one of the other lads, who's a teacher down in Brighton, um, his daughter's like teenage and they've just started board gaming. Uh, so he was asking me, oh, what games can you recommend? So like... Ticket to Ride was was the obvious one. Gateway game, did mm -hmm. send a couple more, um, but yeah. So it's I just can't imagine uh, my life uh, without gaming. Uh, my my dear old departed mum could never understand it. And people used to say to her, you know, what's he doing? Oh, it's this weird hobby where he plays with toy soldiers. He used to say. <laughs> yeah, my, my parents were always like, oh yeah, he's doing his game, and that, that was that was <laughs> as far as they went. Yeah, it it's funny. Um... I was just thinking about that whole social aspect and um, I don't think it was a coincidence that the teacher that taught me, um, she was of kind of Irish descent in, and, and she was very musical, kind of a performer, yeah. a bit of a storyteller. She had that old, um, she would go camping and go to like music festivals and she was a real one of those sitting around the campfire type people telling tales and, and i think a lot of that you know there's a rich tradition of that going back through our history uh and, and i think probably a lot of people that are playing rpgs are kind of trying to bring that back into their life a little bit whereas you know it's it's not so easy perhaps to to meet up around a campfire nowadays i mean you, you know you obviously you can but this is a kind of convenient way to sit and tell stories around a virtual campfire as it were yeah. and, and, and and probably get a, a fairly similar feeling in some ways especially when you think about like um you know you're telling tall tales of daring do and legend and myth and all that um 
the, the other thing I found is a lot of gamers usually are, have a very sort of um, strong interest in history. Mm. Uh, lots of gamers like you know like Vikings or Roman history or whatever. And the other group that I've found is people that like to read uh, novels a lot. Mm. A lot of uh, role players, you know, are heavily into their the fictional, whether it be science fiction, uh, fantasy, uh, and you. And I think with um, role playing in general. If you've got those interests, you've you all got your common bond. And then during the game, if you're playing a fantasy game, you start going off into, oh, you read that? Remember that book by Moorcock? Or remember? And that's another sort of bond that ties you together, isn't it? I mean, I'll tell you one thing I, I think is weird when it comes to that is my um, my younger brother and my dad, we've, we've all sort of, we're all quite heavily into our reading. And um, my dad loves like his like, big series of books. I mean, he's read like the Wheel of Time series, like front to back like no end of times and him and my brother have always been like into like big fantasy like sort of series but my dad also likes a lot of the old science fiction you know your Arthur C. Clarke your Asimovs and stuff like that and I sort of went more into the science fiction end of things and I, I don't I still don't really read a lot of like fantasy novels but when I play D&D or role playing like instantly I tend to lean towards the fantasy rather than the science fiction which mm. I always thought was a bit odd because I'd have thought I'd have gone the other way, given like I prefer reading yeah. like sci-fi. What you read, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, I mean I agree with what you're saying, Pete, about um, it being sort of like um, an activity you know you can share with your mates and stuff like that. And I think one of the one of the sort of nice things about it is it's not like a passive activity. I mean, like, let's face it, you, you get together with your mates, go to the cinema, watch a film, but then you just sat there. You might have a bit of banter while it's on or whatever, but you just sat there watching a film, aren't you? Or, you know, yeah. you, you go you go and watch a football game or whatever, and you sat there watching the football game. Again, a bit of banter, but it, it's fairly passive. Whereas when you're when you're playing a role playing game or, or you're in a war game or something like that, you're you're not only sort of spending quality time with your friends, but you're also sort of actively doing something, you know, you're sort of like engaging your brain and your imagination with it. Which has always appealed to me more than like, oh, let's just sit and like look at that TV screen over there or whatever. Yeah, um, and something that came into my mind was um, people saying about, uh, oh, I played a game and I didn't enjoy it. The system was rubbish. I've often found that even if I'm playing a game which I actually love and know loads about, if it's with the wrong group of players, then it just doesn't work. Um, uh, and I find. That's often when people talk about something that didn't work. It's because the people they're, they're playing with, interacting with, are probably not on the same wavelength as them. Um, you know, if, if you've got a group that's heavily into role play, uh, you're more into the combat, then that, quite often they'll say, oh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel right, or vice versa. So I think having a group of three or four people or, or wherever it is, and that you all gel together and like the same sort of things, I think that makes a, a real big difference to the fun of anyone around the table, immaterial of, of what you're playing. Yeah, it's, it's that whole idea, isn't it, that you know, if you've got if you've got the right group of people and you're all enjoying each other's company, it doesn't matter how like rubbish the game system is or whatever, you can still get some fun out of it. Whereas the reverse isn't the case. You, know, you can have the best game system in the world, but if you don't get on with the group, you still probably ain't going to enjoy it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I, I hear you, you know you hear descriptions of other people's games, or you you maybe catch a live play or uh, something like that, or you know some sort of stream game, and and, and you think, ah, oh, yeah, I just don't that that does doesn't capture my imagination. Or I I don't really fancy that, or or, or maybe you, you hear. Um, see, you see, quite often on the like on the uh, on the podcast scene, you, you hear people, and it, it's quite often this sort of discussion about uh, play acting and role playing your character, and then not not role playing your character, and just like being yourself and stuff like that. Uh, and and I, I feel there there is that is quite a a spectrum of different taste in that area, particularly, and. Uh, that, that I think that that could upset a game because if if you're into playing your character and you're getting into the the amateur dramatics of it all, um, it can kill it stone dead if someone's just sort of sitting there and coming across as a bit of a wet blanket in that context. 
And likewise, if there's someone that just wants to kind of get on with exploring hexes and moving around on a battle mat or, or whatever their kind of um, their taste is, if if there's someone, you know, t- typically it get uh, the the uh, the dig is kind of you know bartering down a price on um, a loaf of bread or something for forty five minutes. Um, that's going to rub somebody wrong the other way. And I guess ideally you, you, you get into a group that just f- meets the happy medium where you're all, you're all sort of happy. But I, I think that is, that is pretty rare. You, you're gonna, I think in a, in a group, especially when you are saying like Pete, you're maybe, maybe there's five players. I think there's always going to be a little undercurrent of, Oh, you know, oh, he's off again, or are we going to get on with it? It's, ne- it's never going to be super perfect, but you're just trying to avoid them big clashes, aren't you? Yeah. I do think that's one of the things that I sort of, obviously I know during the episode, we're going to talk a bit about, you know, what keeps us coming back to the gaming table. I do think that's one of the things that does keep me coming back to the gaming table because there's, there's almost as many different sort of ideas about what role playing is and what a good game is as there are role players, probably more. And no matter what sort of, taste you've got in gaming what you like in gaming there are there are at least going to be a handful of other people out there who've got similar tastes to yourself or like the same games that you like and yeah okay it can be difficult to find people you're going to have like false starts you're going to have groups where you maybe don't get on with the group and stuff like that and it might take you a long time but i like the fact that if you keep looking eventually you will find some people who yeah okay their their sort of style of gaming might not be a hundred percent what you like but it's enough mm. like what yeah. you like that you can it's still workable. enjoy yourself yeah yeah, yeah and um, one of the things i found is if you can find um an online game to play for example um that somebody's advertising and you're not sure my advice is go for it give it a go if it doesn't work out there's nothing lost but if you don't do it and you miss out, then you're going to regret it. And I know it's sort of in the Audio Dungeon Discord at one point before pandemic, we had, there was lots of games uh, going on. And I jumped into several games there, which weren't my, probably my cup of tea. But you just get to meet people. And then I think you learn so much about different styles of play, uh, meeting different people. And it sort of helps you with your, um, with your own uh, character's yeah and your characteristics of adapting to other play styles as well. Mm. Yeah. I think the worst, probably the worst thing you can do, and I don't know if it's just because I'm heavily into this hobby, but I do notice we seem to be as a group quite prone to procrastination. And there's, there's, we could quite often talk about what we're going to do and then just don't actually get, round to doing it because you're trying to look for that perfect thing or you you know and you and you just delay but i think what you're saying there pete is just dive in there really just dive in there and and, and get playing get playing some games and if it if it don't work out as as long as you're not just being nasty to people they're going to understand if if it hasn't quite worked out and you know i, I don't imagine people are going to hold a grudge against you because you've you've said oh yeah i was maybe looking for something a little bit different to what we're doing it's just having that chat isn't it and yeah, being definitely. open about it what i've certainly learned is as a gm the best way to have fun as a gm is run a system that you want to run not run a system that that your players want to run uh, it might be that you you meet and uh, you both want to run it, but I've run games where my players have said, "Oh, yeah, let's let's do this," and I'm like, mm, "Oh, I'll give it a shot," but it's gone for so far, and I just get to the point where I'm not enjoying it. If I'm not enjoying it, it I'm, I'm I, I just can't continue. Uh, but if I get a game where I absolutely love, um, then that for me gives me the fun, gives me the inclinations to prep for it. Probably maybe over prep because I'm enjoying it so much, getting brawled in the law or the system. And I think that was my biggest tip uh, as a GM is run something that you that really interests you uh, that you know how to run because um, that that will make every at least in every session you're doing something you enjoy as opposed to I'm running this game for these guys but it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, I think you make a good point there, Peter. I mean, like I said, as we were chatting just before we came on, 
I'm currently looking to like start a small sort of mini campaign after my previous ones wrapped up. And when I was talking to my group about what we wanted to play, I basically gave them a choice of like three or four games, saying like, "Oh, do any of these appeal?" But I made sure that I picked three or four games that I was actually interested in running because I say like, I could have easily suggested like dozens, but if I suggest something that I don't really fancy running, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we'd really like to play this," but my heart's not in it, I'm not going to have fun. They're not going to get a good game out of it, and no one's going to be happy at the end of the day. You you've got to be inspired, haven't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the big things for me about RPGs it, is it uh, its place as a creative outlet. Yeah. I mean, and that that's massive for me. Like I said, I came in. I I think I came in with the artwork and the painting, uh, imagining characters in my head. Imagining these kind of like worlds with aliens battling, um, re- basically Hoff rebels, um, and it's it's not changed. I've just done different things. Like it's become a podcast or done YouTube videos, and it's just like a vehicle for for doing all of that that stuff. Now, if you get into a game like you guys are saying that you you're not interested in running, that's going to kind of like kill your you're, you can become a little bit resentful of a game, I think, if, yeah. if, you, if you're getting brought to the table and out of a sense of loyalty to your, to your group or a sense of responsibility, you just keep turning up and running these games. Um, I think that's, that's probably where some of this burnout yeah. comes from, a little bit of... Uh, because you're battling with it in, in your mind, you're not settled... Uh- and, and there's and friction. The, and at the same time, you're a player too. You might be running the game, but you want to play as well, don't you? Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons why I always laugh. You know, in that, that inevitable debate when people are talking about, like, oh, whether professional GM should be a thing. I think I'm, 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 if, if someone can run a game that people are willing to pay for, I have no problem with that. You know, fill your boots. Good for you. But yeah, f- yeah. for me, I always think, I'm not, I'm not sure if that would suit me because I, I, I think once it became work rather than something I do as like a release from, from work. work. Yeah, to get away from work. And as like you say, a creative yeah. outlet, as Colin was saying, I think, you know, you almost then become, and I, I see this a lot with people who like don't like the systems or they're not keen on the game. It because You feel obligated to run the game. You're not running it because you enjoy it. You're like, oh, I'm turning up because I've got to turn up to arrange the session tonight. And, you know, people will be disappointed if I don't. And you sort of, it's it's all the sort of negative things that are pushing you into running a game rather than going like, oh, I really love this like system. I love the characters we've got, the stories we tell it. Oh, we had that cool combat last session. Oh, and they're going to try and fight this evil necromancer this session. Oh, it's going to be great. Whereas I would rather have that than thinking like, oh, you know, like this is my job. Or, like, I feel obligated to like do this. I'd rather be doing it. And I, I, I've quite happily admitted that I'm sometimes guilty of over-prepping. But that's because I get really enthusiastic and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I want to draw all these maps and I want to I want to draw out this cave system and uh, I, I want to like work out what like the bad guy's speech is going to be at the end when he confronts the heroes and whatever. And even if you don't use it, you've enjoyed yourself while, while yeah. doing the prep of it. And it's, it's one of the reasons I like the... Um, I like the Lazy GM, like the Sly Flourish books, because yeah. they, they don't say, like, oh, don't do any prep. They're always just saying, like, right, do as much prep as you need to feel comfortable running the game and focus on the prep that adds more value yeah. to your game rather than just... Because I've seen a lot of books where they've been like, oh, you don't need any prep. And I'm like, well, I don't yeah. need the prep, but I quite like doing the prep. Whereas mm, yeah. a, a book like um, Lazy Gem, where it's sort of saying, oh, yeah, you want to do your prep, but like you've only got four hours or whatever to prep for your session. Here's how you can focus that prep to make sure you're getting the most sort of bang for your book when you're doing it. Yeah, I had a, I had a session yesterday. Uh, we do it uh, every other week with, uh, with my home group. So I run one Tuesday and another GM runs the other Tuesday. Anyway, last yesterday, about, must be about two hours before the game, the other GM said, look, something's come up. I can't do it. So all the other players said, can you run something tonight? I said, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll run something. Started the session. It got halfway through the session and I'd run out of things. So I said, can we, take a, can we take a tea break? Give us five minutes. I've had the tea break. I went in, made a coffee, got, got some books out, and then got the second session prepped. And then it turned out we had a, a great session. Uh, and the lad said, well, you did well with that. I said, 
you wouldn't believe I had nothing prepped before we started. Mm. But yeah, sometimes you just need that extra little oomph to get you going. Yeah. But, uh, but the thing I was going to say was, um, the other thing is, if you've got a setting that you want to play and your players suggest a system that you're not interested in, see if you can you play the same setting in a, another system you like. And a prime example of this is, uh, I love the setting of the Ninth World, uh, which is from Numenera. But I know for a fact that I'm probably not going to get my players playing Ninth World. I've looked at it and think, do, do I need to do the uh, do the effort? But then I looked at it and I thought, well, I, I could run it in 5e because they've done a conversion, Monty Cook has. Oh, right. it as, an, uh, as an OSR game, because if you look at something like Vault of Varn, uh, they've done uh, a similar sort of setting. So, if, so my top tip would be, if you like the setting, but you don't like the system, see if you can run it in something else. It might be you don't need to do too much uh, conversion at all. I, I, I can't see many where you would necessarily need to do much conversion at all. Um, because how how much, I mean, there's a lot in these books that's there that doesn't. It, it doesn't need to be there. It's just kind of to make it a full package, make it warrant someone kind of, going out and buying it almost, you know, it's got to be a certain size to even sort of appear on the shelf before it's just yeah. too small. And it's, you know, like all the D and D books, what are they? They're generally about 256 pages to give it some sort of bit of heft. And yeah. yeah I mean, especially if you don't really about, need that stuff. Do you? If you're talking about a campaign background as well, it's like none of the background and the, the lore and stuff like that tends to be like system specific. Like if, no, you, ta if you take, I um, oh, forget what they're called, the um, the sort of one trick magic items in like Numenera, I can't remember what they're called. Oh, the um, ciphers. Ciphers, yeah. If, if you take if you take a cipher, it's like oh, they're ancient remnants of technology which seem magical. They're one use items that do like one cool thing and then they're done. It's like scrolls. Yeah, it's like you 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 can do that in any system. All you've got to all you've got to do is go. Oh, you found this like ma this like magical doohickey. But like when it's activated, it does this. It does it once and it's gone. You don't need any rules other than that, and you can lift that idea straight out. The idea about you know oh it's set in some impossibly far future version of Earth where like multiple civilizations have risen and fallen and all the remnants are there but like no one understands how they work and it's all magical that has been done in like so many like sci-fi books in various other settings and you can lift all of that straight out without having to like take the mechanics with it yeah you, you could probably say a fair bit of that you could apply to systems as well like yeah. you know when you see rules in um for a long time, I was picking up games, especially like OSR games, getting game after game after game. And most of the time, there's probably only one or two rules th that I was more or less getting the game for. Mm. Um, and I mean, I, I generally just quite like artwork work, and I'm maybe looking for a nicer book with a better binding. And you just sort of sometimes up upgrading your collection almost. Uh, but you could probably just half the time just take them rules and add them to whatever your system of choices that you're most proficient with or where you've got the best mastery just drop in rules in there mm. yeah i mean th that's pretty much what i've done with um the osr games i run where let's like say i've got loads of different osr games but i'll generally pick a sort of a fairly sort of basic level one like your old school essentials or your basic fantasy or whatever and then mm. i'll i'll look around and i'll see like other osr games that have got like a specific thing that obviously appeals to the author of that game so you, yeah. you look at something and it's you're like oh it's got like a really really comprehensive rule system for like running a fault say as a random example mm. and i'll go oh i'm interested in like why the the author like likes that and what they've done with that and i might just put that on my shelf not look at it again but if at some point later down the line in my my osc game or my basic fantasy game someone's like oh, do you know what i want to build a castle i'm going to become the lord of this little place i'll be like Oh, do you know what? if I do need some rules, I can yeah. easily just take take wholesale those rules out of that game I've got and just drop it into whatever game I'm running. And 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 how many times, John, have we talked about like a classic game for that is Lamentations? Yeah, you know, there's there's loads of nifty little things in there, and I've I don't think I've 
Mm, no, I've, I, I have actually played at conventions. I have actually played Lamentations as a rule system. But whenever I'm running something of a kind of a, a, a BX old style D and D kind of thing, I'm always robbing stuff out of there and ideas out of there. And, you know, probably when you think about it, it, it's probably like a dozen or more different rule sets that you're drawing from. And it all kind of goes in a document somewhere, doesn't it? The one that I keep going back to is Nave. Yeah. I just look at Nave and think he's done it so simply. Yeah. If if you want to run a one shot, you could just pick up the printing of Nave and and run it on the fly with any old, uh, so, so simple. Yeah. I, I like the spell list. Then there's like 100 spells at the back or something, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, and you can just use that with so much different things, so many different things. And I mean, you, you mentioned the lamentations. I mean, for the longest time, I think I used to just like crib wholesale out of that. Was, I was like, right, black powder firearms. Yeah. yeah. Copy and paste. Oh, and they've, they've also got the, the weird spell system, you know, where it's like, oh, you get your spell failure chances and like weird stuff happens and they've got that bizarre like yeah. su- summoning spell that like takes up two entire pages but like all manner of like craziness can happen because you're literally like reaching into the ether and just like trying to pull something out by the force of will and the economic the economic stuff in there as well i was like that the investment that just it was a really simple little thing i think it was one page just about how you invest money and then the other one was the cost of running your home and employing yeah. retainers it got a really good section in there. Probably the best I've seen, in my opinion. Um, yeah, definitely. I was going to. Sorry, go ahead, Pip. That I was, I was saying with uh, systems, you know, you think you know you can run anything with any system. Uh, a classic example the other day was uh, the release of uh, Doctor Who for Five E. Now, when when that was announced, there was ructions on on social media. What you're doing, running Five E Doctor Who? That's that's ridiculous. You know, there's a system for it. But when you think about it. If there's a huge amount of people that play 5e and there's a chance that you can sell books to them and maybe at some point they will buy your other books, I think it's a, it's a no-brainer. And if people are having fun, does it really matter? Or, or something no, without... and I think... Sorry, go no, ahead. No, sorry, go on, George. I was going to say, without meaning to see mercenary as well, like a, a gaming company, they have to make money to keep employing people and keep the lights on and stuff like that. So if they suddenly go, oh, we're going to release a 5 edition a fifth edition version of our game although fifth edition is not really my speed nothing wrong with it it's just not my particular flavor but if they say we're going to release a fifth edition version of our game they must think they're going to sell that book otherwise they wouldn't release it because they need to make money paizo admitted because paizo released some of their um stuff for 5e recently and there was a big kickback from the pathfinder community and one of the staffers from paizo said if we don't do this the company is bust we need we need the cash so it's it's our choice of we can sell some five E stuff, we can fund the rest of the Pathfinder stuff. And sometimes that's that's the economics for it. Well the thing is love it or hate it, like fifth edition is like the hot thing in like RPGs at the minute. So it only makes sense that as many companies as possible are gonna want to like get especially now they've you know, there's like OGLs and stuff like that and you can you can make stuff for these systems. It's only natural that companies want to get on the bandwagon. And also, if, you, if you're um, if you're doing like your campaign setting and you want to do your world setting or whatever, maybe you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to have to come with a whole new set of rules and play test. Exactly. Them and you're like, I just want to do this setting. What's a nice, simple rule system that I already know there's an established audience for that I can just put my campaign setting out with and sell it to people and get it out there to people. And I, I think Cubicle Seven said that the that when they had the One Ring and Adventures in Middle Earth, Adventures in Middle Earth outsold the One Ring ten to one. No. Yeah, and I, and I was surprised that I thought, oh, the, the, the One Ring was the bigger product, but no. I see. I really liked the One Ring. I I thought it captured the feel of yeah, Tolkien yeah, oh, yeah, really I've... well. Um, plenty of people have talked about that. In particular, Arlen Walker, live from Pelham's Waste. Check him out on YouTube. He is all about that one ring for Tolkien but I just want to do a bit of adventuring in Middle Earth I'm super familiar with 5e that's my best chance of getting it to the table because otherwise the way things are for me that's just going to be too much of a steep learning curve likewise oh Doctor Who yeah 
try a bit of Doctor Who in my 5e game. I haven't got to try and convince all my players that are quite happy with 5e. Whenever I stray away from 5e, unfortunately, it is a little bit of a battle for me to convince people. Because guess what? They don't want to do the work. They don't want to have to go and find out a new system. If they if they're like got a limited amount of time for the hobby. And and let's face it, if you do do a new system, they ain't going to read the rules. And when it comes to the table, they're going to be saying, so Mr. GM or Mrs. GM, uh, what do we do? Oh, tell me what I do now. Oh, what does this do? What does that do? Yeah, so you-, you don't need it. You don't need it, do you? So I, I, I get it. And I also find it quite interesting to have a system and see how different designers and different creators change it up a little bit to create that. I just find from a design yeah. point of view, I find that quite interesting. Like the way they change things to do Beowulf to make it like a one hero with like a kind of uh, people tagging along. I forget what they're called. And the way they, the whole Beowulf design with, with, with the core 5e is really, really, I think quite interesting. Pete, you've played Adventures in Middle Earth. I think they did. Still playing inter- it. 45 yeah, sessions in now. Love it, yeah. 45 sessions in. And I think they did really interesting changes with that. Like, you know, um, I talk about not playing it, playing the game, basically playing D&D without the alignment. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, I don't know about that. You know, you, you do you kind of thing. But Adventures in Middle Earth, that's where I got that idea from. You're 45 sessions in. Do you miss alignment? No. No. And I don't use I don't use the other thing I, normal I find, um, The other thing I find fascinating with five is the number of people that are trying to OSR OSRify it by sort of cutting stuff out and making it more like old school games. Um, and that I mean I don't know if you've seen that um, uh, Dungeon Craft. He's just done what his Deathbringer out, which is yeah, basically yeah. five E and making it more like um, an OSR game in where the death is on the table all the time and simplifying it. I mean, I, I talked a bit about this in uh, my podcast the other day, and I was saying that uh, I, I think the, the the fact is that the the sort of core assumptions about D and D have obviously changed and adapted to like a new market. So, like mm-hmm. the 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 core assumptions of fifth edition are very different to the core assumptions of like Moldvale, like Bagme or something like that, but that's because it's by and large it's not the same like group of people who who were playing the older versions of D&D. And don't get me wrong, I love the older versions of D&D. And yeah. like, fifth edition is not, not really my jam, but it's a very different group of people who are now coming into the hobby who are playing fifth edition. So, again, without meaning to sound mercenary, if you're Wizards of the Coast or Paizo or whoever it is now, and you're uh, you're like, oh, we, we want to sell this game to people, you have to look at your market and go like, right, yeah. What, yeah. what do they it's want? It's got to appeal. Yeah, we, got we, we, we've, we've got to give them what they want, or they ain't going to buy our stuff. Yeah, yeah, you know, th- things like uh, fairy tale uh, PCs don't appeal to me, but they appeal to a lot of people. So that's why that's where it's been made. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and I'm an old man, so like, every time they go like, "Oh, there's a there's a new race coming out, and it's like purple cat people or whatever," and I see it on Facebook, I'm like, "Oh, come on, have a word with yourself." But they wouldn't be bringing that out unless people yeah. wanted to play it. So. And like I said, like I said in my um, my podcast episode recently, I've accepted the fact that like the the sort of core version of like fifth edition as it is now isn't really made for me. But that's where, as Colin was saying, we've got Adventures in Middle Earth, numerous other third party things using like the fifth edition chassis. And like I said, I've got Adventures in Middle Earth, and even if I don't run fifth edition. As we said, there's a lot of stuff you can just take out. There. Like, I love the yeah, journey, yeah. I love the journey rolls in Adventures in Middle Earth. Yeah. I could take that mm-hmm. and put that in any D game. Yeah, you can put that in any OSR game. That to yeah, grab from it. But um, I think that's another thing that keeps me coming back to the game. You know, yeah, it's probably a good a good chunk of us are into that tweaking and tinkering type of thing and i think that's probably just another type of creativity isn't it it's like looking for that mashup taking this rule you know how how many of us must have spent money on games just knowing that you're not going to run the game you're just going to mash that in with something else so, um, I, I i mean i've done it in, in the middle earth game is if if there's a rule that i don't think is working i'll i'll change it up my players often, quite often don't even know i've changed it because i'm rolling off screen or I'm making the decisions off screen but I think as 
as a GM, you're always trying to sort of get that, you're aiming for that perfect experience on you, that one yeah. that, make, that you enjoy, but also that sort of runs seamlessly. I was going to say, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the um, the Man of La Mancha, Don Quixote, but um, there's, a, and I promise this, we'll get back around to her RPGs in a bit, but, it, <laughs> but it, it's, it's basically, like, very roughly, the story is like, there's an old boy who like gets fed up with like his life, and he's like, oh, everything's like rubbish, and he suddenly goes, do you know what, forget this, I'm going to be like one of the old knights of legend, and he gets himself like some armour, gets himself like a knackered old horse, gets himself a lance and it, obviously he, he sort of lost his marbles a bit but he goes out and he's going to become a knight and he talks to he sort of gets his neighbour involved as like a squire and he goes out and has all these crazy adventures but there's a bit of that where he talks about what he calls like a, the impossible quest where he's like oh it's not important you know if he reaches the end of his quest it's the fact he's trying to get there that's important and one of the things I, I like about role playing games that brings me back to it is, as we were saying earlier, there's people like always chasing like the perfect system. But mm. I wonder how many people who have been chasing that perfect system they're never going to find. But no. through chasing it, how many people who've come up with their own systems, made their own games, and made new like great products that people love, as a result of sort of chasing that dream that they're never going to get. And I like the fact there's always people sort of going like. Uh, oh yeah okay the, this system doesn't really work for me let's see if i can make it oh no it's, it's not really work right i'm going to chase the next perfect sort of system and even if they never get there a lot of the stuff they produce along the way is very interesting and it might not be the perfect system for them but it might work great for somebody else and uh looking at the bookshelf behind john and i know my collection is the same that's what you mean man i love reading rules it doesn't matter if i'm never going to play them i'm never going to play them i think it's very rare that I read a rule book when I don't find some little snippet of information or a little mechanic. I think, oh, I like that. I, I think I could use that. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, so I was just going to say, I think that's, it's that having, I like, I like to, well, I, I kind of pride myself on trying to keep an open mind a little bit. That's something I strive for. I'm not saying I always achieve it, but I try and keep an open mind. You know, I, I do, I do, have opinions but they're generally fairly flexible and i know you guys are as well because we, we've had loads of discussions where we've sort of like even between us we've changed our minds and discussed things uh, and it's because you're it's this constant like you're saying john you're striving to improve and, and, and come across this like perfect play experience or whatever i mean that's what all them really all them books are and all, all, all the stuff you're talking about that you've uh, you've bought, Pete, just you know to read the rules and that is this striving, and I think it ties in almost with the games themselves. The idea yeah. of that adv that adventure and exploration. You, you're not you're not confining it to the sessions. I think we're clearly that type of person that just enjoys that blend of creativity and exploration, and it goes through the whole business of the hobby. Whether you know whether you're talking about the way that you record your podcast or the or the music you use or the the rules or the you know all, all the things you do it, it just kind of that it's maybe it's like a curiosity I don't know it's maybe just like this kind of curiosity and I, I think that's really interesting and I think that's why I tend to push back you know when when people sort of maybe talk a little bit about that. I find sometimes find people's tone a bit too absolute for me, and it kind of makes me think, well, is that is it really that clear cut? And I sort of push, I tend to push back against it because I feel like you don't want to shut the door mm. on stuff and lock it. You know, you want to kind of maybe uh, maybe you don't want to look that way for a little bit, but you maybe don't want to close the door and lock it and just say, no, that's it's, that's not it, the way. I, I I've been guilty of this myself. It's easy to say, you know, when somebody. Uh, brings a system out or describes a, a game system and you think, oh, abs absolute garbage. Oh, I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. And now I, my my views change with, yeah, that's not sort of thing for my, I'll play, but if it, if it makes you happy, fill your boots with it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, a, a good example of that uh, was uh, when you suggested I use uh, the, the fifth edition starter set to uh, to run a game. Or the, my, base, my or, or the basic yeah. rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the free, and, um, yeah. Colin was like, oh, well, Colin was like, oh, have you thought about trying 5th edition? And I was like, 
Yeah. And he was, he was like, well, it was like, well, what, what don't you like about it? And I'm like, oh, the, the, there's a bit too much stuff. There's too many feats and there's too many subclasses and whatever. And he was like, well, why don't you try getting onto this starter set? It's free, which is always a good thing. And, <laughs> and it's like limits the options. So why don't you try running that? So I was like, oh, do you know, what? I'll give it a go. I'm just running a, a couple of little games at a, a local convention. Nothing too serious. Give it a little go. P- printed out a copy on Lulu. Ran absolutely fine thoroughly enjoyed it and i think mm. probably since then probably a bit before then but certainly since then i've tried to less sort of say like oh you know i think a game's crap or whatever mm. but quite often i'll just sort of say like oh do you know what this game's not for me yeah mm. it's not it's not for me no because mm. i say normal normal fifth edition it's not my speed mm. but that, that's not saying it's bad. It's just saying it's not going to be the first game I reach for if I if I say I want to start a campaign. And so I said we were talking about um, we we're talking about Easy D Six Pete that I know both me and you have yeah. picked up recently. And I was saying like, oh, I could see me really using it and really loving it because there's some great things in there for like so one shots or small sort of like convention games. But because f- I tend to be more of a sort of campaign GM by like preference. I wouldn't see me running it for a long campaign. Not that you couldn't run it for a long campaign, but it just doesn't feel like, it, for me, it would gel as well with like my particular taste. But again, that's not to say it's a bad game. There's some great stuff in it. And even if I never run it as it's planned, some of the ideas out of that I might sort of copy and paste into other games. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it, it's, fr- it's just the way you frame it. You know, it's, you're just talking about personal taste there and you're being less sort of prescriptive or whatever. And I do wonder whether we sort of, I mean, I know it's a sort of a bit of a trope, you know, we get a bit more set in our ways as we get older. Cause I mean, I remember like when, like I said, when I was running Warhammer fantasy and I was using like figures out of the old, like hero quest board game. And I was like taking bits out of like advanced fighting fantasy. You just threw them all in, didn't you? And you had fun mm-hmm. with it. Like I know there weren't as many games, but back when we sort of started off in terms of like role playing games, but I think I was probably far freer with like what I would throw into a game and use back then than I was sort of later on. I think I've only really now started to get back into that sort of state of mind where I'm like, do you know what? Even if I don't run this game as is, I can probably still get something of value out of it. Yeah, I think so. I think, like, as a youngster, anything would go. Yeah. Then, as I got into being a teenager, now I was a lot more of a stickler about things. And I remember trying to get my players, you know, to insisting that they would write a background and, you know, just kind of like really. Um, a six page background that, that no one's ever going to read. <laughs> yeah, and you've got to do this and you've got to do training and you've got to do the other. And then I've just sort of, I feel like I've probably gone full circle now. And I quite like it. So there's been a little bit more talk recently about wargaming and the idea of just getting like a box of kids' toys and figures and just like tipping it out on a table and just getting a few dinosaurs and Buzz Lightyear and Green Army Men and whatever is in there and just kind of some Lego and just make up this weird battle. And then the challenge would be how to make it work and, you know, how do we do this? And, yeah, maybe you use... Uh, you know what you see is what you get kind of concept and um just doing something like really spontaneous and fun the type of thing that you could probably you know for me now it, that could be something you could take into a classroom and just go like here's a box of stuff turn it out and as part of a design lesson it's getting them thinking uh you know using that as a a a tool to inspire people to come up with some creative thought and just go oh yeah what about this guy and just get everybody talking and moving stuff around and handling things and um that that type of thing interests interests me interests me now more than you know sticking rigidly to some kind of real big old rule book or something yeah i I saw an interesting one i think it was on reddit the other day where someone it was brand new to uh, role playing wanted to play with some mates and i i can't remember if it it was vampire or D, &D, but said um 
uh, I've had a look at the book. Oh, there's so much stuff in there I need to learn, you know, about the law and about the history and all that. Uh, it's overwhelming. And several people came back and said, no, no, that's the wrong way to think about it. Yeah, you, you start off with, you know, the the house they live in or the village they live in and that's and ask them you know uh, a couple of things that they know around and start that and build and i think i mean obviously the company's got to sell a book with loads of law in because they, they want to sell the books but yeah. i think for newcomers into the hobby it can be overwhelming you know a, a thousand years of history of uh of the old empire yeah we're well, not going to read all that are you i mean i do, I, I do. sorry go ahead go on john i was, no, gonna, no, go on, john. I was gonna say i do wonder whether sort of like starting off a bit earlier where we sort of had a, a bit of an advantage in that regard because obviously there there weren't that many books about so you didn't have much choice like you either stuck to just what was in the book which you you pretty soon ran through and you were like right, I've, I've done all that and then you had no choice but to like make just make stuff up or like grab it from like what few other books you could find whereas i can easily see if you come in now and obviously there's I'm not saying that this stuff is bad, but you know, you come in now, there's like YouTube channels full of advice, there's like millions of different systems, there's books of advice on how to run different systems, there's all this law. I could see how, like, if you came in now from with no prior knowledge and you were just sort of like dropped into the middle of the tabletop sort of RPG sphere, how it could be a little bit overwhelming if you know if you didn't have anyone else you could like speak to, but on the flip side. It's also a great resource, and as you were saying, there's a there's no end of people. I mean, obviously, there's going to be like idiots, but th there isn't like every sort of like walk of life. But there's because we've got like the internet now and stuff like that. There's no there's no like oh I don't know anyone who role plays. I've I've just got to like guess myself, which great in some ways, but you can now just like reach out on like social media or whatever, and there will be hundreds of people who can answer. It any question you might have about tabletop RPGs. It is a massive game changer, the whole internet, when you think that that has just turned the hobby upside down in terms of our what our early play experience was yeah. to now what you can do. It, it's... It's a different I, I, world. It's a different I, world. I sometimes sit there in a the game and I think, right, I'm sitting here in the UK and playing with people from Canada, Germany. Uh, this is bonkers. This is yeah. absolute bonkers. And it's live chat, uh, no delays. It's like sometimes you think, ah, oh, no. oh, no. <laughs> it's, you it's know, like we're living in the ninth when, world, mate. <laughs> 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 uh, and can you imagine it? If you if you you didn't even you didn't dream of it, did you? As no. yeah kids if someone had said to you and it's not a, it's not really that long ago say it's 30 years ish um you you just couldn't imagine it could you like carrying a, like your mobile phone i mean i was sitting playing with um tj and a load of people off the audio dungeon it was about I don't know, half four, five a.m. in the morning. I was in Carnarvon, of all oh, places, yeah. sat on a bench outside a Premier Inn with the castle behind me, playing a role-playing game on my phone. Yeah, just what? Well, let, let me say, <laughs> if, if if when I'd got like my first like crappy like computer, you just said like, oh, one day you you're literally going to be able to run games and communicate with like people on the other side of the world with, like no delays no real issues and you will just be that there'll be all these programs you can use like virtual tabletops and all these note-taking programs and stuff like that i'd have laughed at you mm. to be honest mm. yeah oh uh, going off the topic uh slightly what do you think about uh drive through and uh, roll 20 merging I, I sort of, to be honest, I sort of thought it was bound to happen eventually. Because I mean, drive throughs pretty much sort of got the monopoly on, mm. on sort of selling like RPGs. If you're if you're investing in the two platforms, it's fantastic. I do I, I do wonder how it's going to affect some of the smaller publishers that maybe at the moment sell to Fantasy Grounds, maybe sold to Foundry. You know, are they going to get to some point where they say, "I'm sorry, you can only sell your stuff on Roll Twenty." Well I, well, I don't know about that, but I know there. Um, I know there's official old school essentials support for Foundry coming soon. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think I as, mean, as long as there are, I mean, these don't matter, VTTs, like Roll20s, are like long established. But yeah. especially recently, there's there's like a plethora of other options out there, and some of them will some of them will go under, or they they won't last the long term. But I think enough of them are sort of sticking around. Like you said, we've got we've got Fantasy Grounds, we've got Roll Twenty, we've got Foundry, um, Owl Bear. I know that's changing into like a new version soon, but you know it's still going to be there. But yeah, um, Rune Hammers VTT. Exactly. Yeah, there's enough of them that stick around that like there's not like a VTT monopoly. Whereas for for drive through in terms of like selling RPG PDFs there's not really any competitors for like drive through so oh, f- so for yeah. me if you're like a vtt and you're like i want some oh that uh, pdf support mm. they seem to be the natural people to go to because they, they've pretty much got that market sewn up at the minute i mean mm. I, don't mind, I, I think some sort of level of competition for drive through would be healthy so I see that competition is good to like keep costs. I know, I know like a, a few have tried itch, and I got stuff on itch, have you? Um, and yes, you can still suffer there, but I mean, it's nowhere near these of the uh, accessibility of drive through. And I know people have got stuff on both platforms saying, yeah, you know, drive through just blows it out of the water. If you're known, especially, you know, if you've got a name for yourself, then drive through is a place. If you're unknown, I think the danger is because it's so huge that you can't get yourself your stuff seen on there. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very difficult because drive through has been established for so long that I think it's going to be very difficult. No, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but it's going to be very difficult for any sort of one wanting to like proffer an alternative to like really make a dent in their market share. Because you know, you've if you just come along and you're like, oh, well, we're we're offering the same sort of thing that drive through do, but like that there's less of it. People go be like, well, I'll stick with drive through then. It's a bit, it's a bit like yeah. you know when um when they used to, when streaming services first like Netflix and whatnot, and mm. then you got other streaming services coming up. They only started making a dent in Netflix when they started going like, oh, we're offering this different type of TV program that you can't get on Netflix. Yeah. So yeah. I think anyone who's trying to make a dent in like drive throughs market share, they're going to need to offer something that drive through doesn't offer to like get people interested. And I don't know what that is to be honest. Mm. Some sometimes companies will just do something silly, won't they? They'll either become complacent, or they'll start. They make a bad choice and be and, and become disrespectful of their customers in some way. It would take something like a major faux pas by someone high up that that could bring down a company. An example in the UK, business wise, would be the likes of Ratners. The mm. jewelers, the high street jewelers that just kind of come out and basically called their customers uh, morons. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think they more or less vanished overnight. Mm. Uh, it's sort of something like that. You know, some some big faux pas like so, the, the type of drama that all too the, often uh, crops up in I mean, RPGs. I, I haven't used uh, Roll20 for a couple of years, but I know certainly when I used it last, I thought it was like, Certainly then it was slow, uh, laggy, very outdated. Uh, people that have been using it for years tell me that a lot of the code there is going back to like the 20, nearly 20 years. So it's going to be very difficult for them to, um, unless they get a, a big injection of money to to over, overhaul it. Um, and what with, I mean, it's, the rumours are that uh, what's he going to have their own VTT when uh, D&D 5.5 comes out, which I can quite see. So I suppose mm. like from drive throughs that they're looking at a, uh, because all their third-party content would not be available on the new D&D um, BTT because they only do their own stuff. So I suppose they're looking at being a sort of a competitor to it. So, um, I think a potential issue you, you might get there, and again, to sort of go back to like the, the streaming service analogy, is we're at the sort of situation now where, the particularly in like America, where there's like most streaming services, where like mm. s- pe- people are now just starting to get like disenchanted with it because they're like, oh... So if I want to watch Star Trek, I've got to get this streaming service. And if I want to watch this, I've got to get this streaming service. And I think they're at the point now where they've they've sort of spread the content so thinly that there's nothing really that people are just like, I don't I don't want six different streaming services. I'm just just gonna pick I'm just gonna pick one. I think if we if we sort of start getting to that level where um, there's there's various different sort of platforms only offering little bits little pieces of the pie i think people will start getting disenchanted with it because like it's like with virtual tabletops you, you tend to pick one you like don't you 
and you go yeah. with that. Mm-hmm. You don't go like, oh, I'm paying for like a Roll20 account. Oh, but I've also got a, I've also got a mm-hmm. Fantasy Grounds account I'm paying for. Oh, and I think I'm going to pick up a paid for uh, hosted uh, Foundry account. You pick one you like and, and you stick with it. The, the last 12 months, there must be 10, 15 new virtual tabletops come out. Certainly in the last two months alone, there's been, I think, four uh, 3D t- virtual tabletops coming out to compete with tabletop simulator. Anything? If, hey, you, I've, you've I've probably reviewed most of them, mate. You pay. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I said, that's that's I how I found that's about new VTTs. I'm like, yeah, Pete's just, got a new video up, a new VTTs out. That's it. That's it. It's exactly the same <laughs> for I've, me. I've actually got a list of uh, VTTs that I still haven't looked at yet, and, and yeah. it's quite large. Coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I sort of, um, again, I know we're getting a bit off topic, but I uh, I sort of, I, I used Foundry for a bit, and then I sort of went off that, because we, we had some performance issues, which were probably just due to the ridiculous amount of modules I had installed and whatever. But um, we, we switched to, like, Owlbear, just to, like, finish off Smoke and Snow. But then for our next game, we're like, oh, well, let's try, let's try Foundry again, and let's try and make it a bit more streamlined. I don't need to keep all my notes on there now, because I've got Obsidian notes for that. So... Hopefully we can go back to that. But again, like I say, you sort of pick what you like, don't you? And I think it's as there's more and don't you know, more choice is always a good idea because you know more people can pick what they like. But I think there's only so much money to go around. Yeah. In terms of VTTs, I, so. I, I was chatting to someone the other day and. Uh, t- his group uh, saying they use a Miro whiteboard, which is like an endless whiteboard. And they upload the tokens to it, upload upload their maps to it, um, and just obviously keep their character sheets. So that's, even with all these virtual tabletops, uh, people still, I know some people still just use Discord and and video, don't they? So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've used um, I forget what the program's called, but it's basically like the like Google Draw or whatever in like a Google Drive. Yeah, Jamboard was yeah. it? Jamboard. Yeah, yeah, Jamboard. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you can just, yeah, you can just sketch out a map fine on that and drop a few things on it and move them around. Yeah, yeah. There's there's quite a lot of I've noticed with the crossover with education. There's quite a lot of stuff that works kind of well between the two. And at the moment, a, a lot of educators use like graphics tablets, like a Wacom graphics oh, yeah. tablet. Yeah, yeah. And the cl- the the kids in the class use them, and you've got these uh, limitless whiteboards and that you can just move stuff. You could, I guess, get your whole campaign onto like a sheet and, and just be able to move it around and just manipulate it. And you could probably just do it as one big massive map, a bit like, you know, when it's, we talk about, um, uh, oh, it's gone straight out of my head. You know, the drop in, drop out game. West, oh, the, West uh, marches, West marches style, uh, West uh, West marches, uh, where the idea was that the, that the people was carving stuff into a table down at the tavern at yeah, the yeah. end, it, and you could almost do that type of thing really well on like one of these big whiteboards because you could just come in, add all them details, and this this whiteboard is saved and persists from yeah. session to session, uh, and that. You know that would be a smart way, and you could do, you could do something similar with the likes of Obsidian as well, and have having all the links and the way that links up in that graphical network yeah, of yeah. stuff, and you can collaborate. So there's, I think there's there's loads of stuff that you know we were just talking about that small little bit of, of VTTs, mm. but when you think about all the other different types of computer software uh, and how they could mushroom as people get more it uh savvy mm. um like goblin's henchman i remember he did an episode one time talking about spreadsheets yeah yeah now some people are re- i'm imagining yourself john uh, and probably you as well pete you must be pretty slick with the old spreadsheets oh, I've, I've doubled uh, in an excel spreadsheet in my time or two Stop there you go okay. yeah there you go and I thought it was a really cool idea the way he was talking about, you know, you can have notes associated with cells and you could do your adventure as a spreadsheet. You've got multiple tabs on there and, you know, you... Oh, well, yeah, I mean, in... Um, so many options. By the time we finished um, Smoke and Snow, like I said, we were doing the maps in Owl there, very simple, just a few sort of tokens and whatnot. And um, we just had the character sheets in a, a Google Drive spreadsheet, a couple of tabs, you know, one for the one for the characters... One for the hilings, one for like any the the treasure pot, effectively, 
and I just mm -hmm. share the link like in a Zoom meeting at the start. Mm -hmm. There's the link to the Google Drive. People have it up in their browser. But again, I use a lot of maps for D and D. Like I say, we're, since we're talking about potentially doing like Dresden Files or something a bit more modern for a sort of interim campaign before we start our next big one. Mm -hmm. With, uh, I'm like, how, how many maps do I actually need? I mean, take take like a if I'm running a Dresden Files game, I can easily see it. Oh, I'm going to run it in a city. All right, I need, I need a city map. That that's it. It's just a, a picture of a city map. So, mm -hmm. so like, really, like, how much do you actually need? I could just hit, here's here's a link to that that map in a, on a Google Drive, uh, and we'll just sit in Zoom and do our thing. And I, I, I tell you what, I like doing as well. If if I'm doing something where I don't probably don't need a map, maybe I'm doing it theatre of the mind, or I'm just having a, an RP um, session where they're going to you know chat with the head of the local guild. I often like just like. Uh, Doing a Google search for you know, fantasy art map or fantasy That's concept it. art, look, yeah. get an image and just banging an image on there, yeah. and just with that one image, it uh, helps you as the GM sort of sell a scene without having to say too much, doesn't it? To get that almost like a mood board sort of uh, idea. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And do you want to have to faff about getting it? I mean, I don't know how much hassle, but uh, it's, well, for Albert Rodeo and um, Rune Hammer, just doing that is super easy, yeah. but. You, you you could do that in um, and and the other thing anything I mean, screen share. Yeah, on I Zoom did it uh, with um, Dungeon Alchemist. I wanted uh, they were going to see a dying man in his bedroom, so I just auto generated a bedroom map in there in three D, tilted it, took a, a screenshot of the computer, and banged that on there, and took less than a, less than a minute to do custom room, and it just gives it a bit of flavour. Mm. But yeah. one thing I, I will say, and I know I played in John's game where he does it, where you know you have music in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I found that I I really enjoy having some some sort of musical background noises. Uh, quite often I have uh, if they're in a medieval city, I'll have street sounds. Mm. I get some of the players that really like it, and others just mute it and it doesn't interest them, doesn't add anything to their game. I, but, I'm I'm I I like it, so I I wouldn't mute it. Mm. So it's nice to have the option there, isn't it? That you know you've got the technology, and with the press mm. of a few buttons, you've got access to all all them special effects. You can throw them throw them on the play, like you say, the players that want it is there for them, and the players that want don't want it. If you're doing it by Discord, I use a Discord bot. They can also the, the level themselves so if they want it low or or higher. They got options to it, but I think you know stuff like that. I uh, I quite given the option to players because then it helps with their immersion. If, if they're not interested in it, fine. Uh, mm. Another thing I like, especially for in-person games, is uh, handouts. Mm, uh, you know, yeah, If they yeah. find a letter, getting an old scroll out, I'll, I'll mm. type it out on some parchment paper and I might burn it, spread some coffee on it, crumple mm -hmm. it up a bit. And it's sort of, if you've got something tactile in the hands, and sometimes it's... It again, though, it, it, even, even if you're doing an online game, you can still... Like, I'll quite often... Yeah. You, know, you go online, you find like a parchment background. I can like put it into Photoshop or whatever, put my text on it. You know, mm -hmm. if it's a, if it's like a, a weird sort of arcane like scroll, they've got to decipher. You, know, you can find like a weird symbol font and like change the text and then save a couple of different versions of it and stuff like that. And I mean, I think to to come back to the sort of like the main subject of like finding the fun, one of the things that mm. keep keeps me coming back to to RPGs is the fact that it's always changing and it's always sort of moving yeah. on with the times. There's, I mean, Dave, like I say, I, I love the old games, absolutely great, but there's also all of this technology and all of this new stuff that I never even dreamed of when I first got into the hobby that you can use or not as you see mm. fixed. Like I say, you don't need it, but if you want to get into that, there's all these different options there. And another thing is, let, let's face it, the, the the three of us now. I mean, I've been gemming since like my teens, and I'm like what forty two this year, and I'm still interested. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm still I'm still like interested and like enthusiastic about these new developments and talking about mm. books and stuff like that. And I can't honestly think of another hobby or sort of leisure activity where for like thirty plus years I'm still as excited about it now. Mm as I was when I first got into it. Like, like um, Colin was saying, I used to love doing a bit of drawing, a bit of writing and stuff like that when I was younger, but that hasn't really sort of lasted in the same way for me that RPGs have. And I think that's because it has the 
the element of you know getting involved with other people and it being a social activity it's not just me sat writing in a room or drawing in a room or whatever but like i said i can't think of any other hobbies that have held my interest for that length of time uh, you know you talk about uh, rpgs adopting uh, you know the new technologies i think they as technology has changed they've been at the forefront you know pdfs um, online rules um even such things now as diversity i think the rpg hobby probably welcomes diversity more than any other hobby out there it, it, it doesn't matter uh, what your gender is what your color is there's, there's games been written for all interests uh, all sexualities all it's just there's something there for everyone and i think very few hobbies that you could find that no matter what your interests your persuasion or whatever there is there is something there for you and not only that is there is like-minded people that are there that you, know, you can find yeah and as we said earlier what whatever your whatever your particular flavor is there's there's going to be a game and a group of people out there that you can enjoy gaming with and yeah it, it might take you a while to find people but it's never been as easy as it is now like with with the internet and stuff like that that we've been saying for you to find people who share similar role play related interests as yourself i mean there's always there's always people like trying to start games trying to find players for games trying to get into games and stuff like that and yeah okay it can be a bit of a slog sometimes but compared to compared to like when i started and it was like okay yeah you've basically got the the pool of people in your like little town uh, and that that's who that's who you're stuck with so you know and everybody else the the town went, Dude, stay away from them <laughs> yeah and, and it's like it was just one of the things that sort of like blew my mind when i first got into sort of doing youtube videos online like years ago and uh getting involved with like playing in games that people were running online it's because previously my sort of pool of gamers had been like because I live in a small town, I've been like six people, and it was like if you didn't want a game with those six people, where well, you're out of luck. You were used. Yeah, yeah. So whereas now, like you say, if you've got an internet connection, you can go online and you can easily find a game to jump in with many I, and various I never, people. So when I started gaming back sort of late seventies, early eighties, if you'd said to me that one day gaming would be cool, I went, nah, that's never gonna happen. It's gonna, but it is. You know, uh, there's t-shirts being made. It's on. You know, on TV shows, it's on the uh, biggest streaming uh, platforms. Of, you know, I just can't believe how the hobby has uh, taken off. Yeah, no, I do wonder how much of that is due to the fact that obviously the the people who sort of like played the games when they were young, and now the people sort of writing the games mm, or calling the or, shots, yeah, or sort of do, and, doing other things within sort of creative media. And th- something else I heard uh, the other day was uh, we're now. Uh, that we've got a generation of gamers who are second generation or second and third generation. Not only did their fathers play, but their grandfathers played as well. And that's probably one of the few hobbies where games have been handed down from grandfather to son, or from son to grandson now. I always think that's amazing because like, none of the rest of my family were like, really into like gaming. Oh. But um, as you guys know, I like to do a, a bit of LARPing now and again. And uh, there's the events we go to. There's people who've been sort of like bringing their kids, and like their kids mm. are now like grown up, and we've sort of known them since they were like tiny. And you know, you've you see them sort of like a few events every year, and they're now grown up, and some of them are bringing their kids to the events. Mm. And like I say it's just mind blowing when you think about it. Cause, you know, I'd have loved like back in the day if like my mm. parents had been like into gaming, or you know, would have taken me to like a LARP event or like something like that. And I, I, I do think that, like, so as a bit of a sort of older and in inverted commas, like, gamer, yeah, the tendency is to just be like, oh, well, you know, we, we didn't have any of that. We oh, they got it so easy, you know. They should, should be mm. like, they, they don't know the struggles we went through when we were all being called nerds and whatever. <laughs> but um, I was thinking, oh, forget, forget that. I'd have loved it mm. if, like, gaming would have been as popular as it is now when I was young. Yeah. I just, I just can't understand some of the old gamers. I mean, I'm probably the age of some of them who are intolerant of the changes in the hobby. I just think you've got to move with the times. If you want to still play your old games, you can do that. Nobody's taking it off you. But yeah, because it's for the people, other people that are joining. Because it's not really, it's not really changing, is it? It's it's an evolution that's hmm. going on, and well, it's not even an evolution because the old stuff is still there it hasn't ceased to exist 
it's no one's just, taking your books off you, have they? No one's taking your book. It's just new f- things have come along, um, and I, d- I don't understand. I don't really understand the animosity. I don't know. Is it like a defensive thing going on? You know, because it was a struggle, and uh, gamers were definitely victimised back in back in the day. Um, and is there a little bit of uh, animosity because younger get? Is it felt by some that younger gamers haven't really earned their spurs and they're just getting a free ticket into the hobby? Which I don't, I don't really understand. It's you know, it's just different times, and I, why should they have to struggle? You want you want it to be welcoming. Um, I, I, mean, I, I don't know if it's that, and, 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 and like no one's taking the books away. I mean, is it because it's not the current the current thing and they want the old thing to be the current thing and be yeah, in the yeah. prime position? I don't know. I, I, I can, so, I can sure. sort of understand it a bit because any any time through like, and I'm, I'm not a history expert, but any time through like history, whether it be like technology, sort of social changes or whatever, whenever there's been any sort of like big change in anything, there there's always people who are sort of like, oh, well, you know, I, I like things the way they are. And I'd like them to stay the way they are, and I think so. Certainly, with technology, as times moved on, that change has accelerated so much that whereas it was like in the past, you might be like, "Oh, we've got this bit of this bit of technology coming in." All right, you know, it's not going to change for like the next like twenty years or whatever. We're still going to have horses and carts in like twenty years. It's going to be fine, and then like gradual change coming in. Whereas now, with technology moving so quickly. Like you almost don't have a chance to like catch your breath before the next change is coming. And I see this a lot where where I'm like working, where we've got like people who've been like working in accounts for since, since like before computers came in, and now it, with quills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and they 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 used to like the old like adding machines and stuff like that. Hmm. And but now like the it's like a new computer system like every like couple of years, and it's moving so fast that, that they struggle to keep up with it. And, and I can understand going like, oh, I owned the, the sort of, uh, I suppose, fear of going like, oh, well, you know, what? for the past umpteen years, I sort of knew everything about this and I knew where mm. I was and I knew what to do. Whereas now, like, I just can't wrap my head around this stuff. And like, by the time I have, it'll have changed again. So, yeah, I, you, you, yeah, you could have feelings of like feeling threatened and overwhelmed and you could become resentful. Because it makes you feel like that, I guess. Yeah, you know, you yeah. feel this threat and then you think, oh, well, why do I feel threat? And this was my hobby. I used to like this and now everything's coming along and changing and people are changing it into something I don't like. Yeah, I mean, And you could get resentful, I guess. You often hear the, the sort of idea, Prof, that uh, people, and this is a bit of a meme on the internet, but people come into a hobby, they... They they come in they go oh let's let's take D and D as as the stereotypical like role play example so like me, me as like a young whippersnapper come to you like Colin and I'm like oh I've heard, I've heard about this uh, this cool D and D game you're running can I like can I like join in and play it so I join in the game I start playing it you're running like an older version of D and D and I'm then like oh could we maybe like try this or like try something new or like try change it anyway and you and the rest of your group might be like well we kind of like kind of like it the way it is you know so and then in the sort of meme it's then the person sort of saying like, oh you know they feel a bit sort of the new person sort of saying oh they they feel like they're not being taken seriously or they're being like victimized a little bit whereas it's just like people who've been gaming like as they have been for like 30 years and they're like oh we don't we don't want to change it you know we'll be fine with our game the way it is so I can understand like a bit of sort of friction and a bit of like possible resentment on both sides, but I think a lot of it could be could be solved, you know, by just like having a having a conversation. You know, if if someone comes into your game and it's been established for like ten years and it's fine the way it's running, and they're like, oh maybe we could try this or what about this? There's this new thing, and you're like, oh it's we we don't think it's going to work for our game. Maybe like suggest they like run a one shot or maybe you go oh i tell you what we'll we'll do a couple of one shots and we'll try the idea see if it works and then if it does maybe we do bring it to the game if it doesn't no harm done it's just a couple of one shots so i think 
I think it's the the sort of initial sort of like shock factor of like you know someone comes in and says like sort of implies probably not meaning to but implies there's something wrong with the way you're doing things at the minute that people just tend to like the instinctive reaction is what's wrong with what I'm doing at the minute it's been working fine up to now and I can understand that I, I, I'm guilty of doing that myself yeah like, well like I said earlier when when I see like a new like random like furry racers like come out for day and day and I'll just be like oh really though like, like when they when they when they bought out the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle race and mm. and I was like really mm. but, but, yeah but, I mean it's, in our game I said yeah no Dragonborn in my game not a thing in mine if, if you want to play them join another game but for me and it's, e it's easy to have them isn't it uh, at the end of the day but yeah talking of one shots i think one shots is a great way of keeping the fun i mean especially if you've especially if you've had you know like johnson had a long campaign you've run for maybe two years run two or three one shots get a palette of, cleanser a pal palette cleanser isn't it yeah it is yeah and sometimes you have a one shot you think actually i quite like that i'd like to do more of that or you think i've tried it yeah it's not for me but you've tried, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, that's what we're sort of doing with our. Uh, now we've finished Smoke and Snow because we've been we've been doing like an OSE campaign for like nearly two years, like umpteen hours played in it, sort of like 40, 50 odd like sessions played in it, and we were like, well, we 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 want to do something a bit different, a bit of a change of pace, not just jump straight into more D and D, or we don't want to do a big long running campaign, so we've just done one. And we're like, oh, well, how about we just do like a, a short term, like Dresden Files accelerated campaign? A bit, bit of fate, something like that. You said, like a bit of a palette was, cleanser. Didn't your Burning Wheels uh, campaign finish recently as well? Yeah, yeah. And um, Johannes, who ran that, because that's quite involved, he was mm. like, all right, I'm going to need, I'm going to have a month off. So I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll, I might run a few one shots in the same slot, you know, just to keep things going. And, um, after he's had a month off, he's like floated a few ideas for various games, and he's going to come back. You know, once he's had a bit of a break and he's caught his breath, and we'll we'll go on to something else. But again, that might not be another massive like long running campaign, because they say. And again, that that is another thing that does keep me coming back to RPGs, and that does keep it fun for me. The fact that it's it's not one sort of mode of playing. It's not like right, you ha you have to play all long running D and D campaigns. That's how the mm. game works. It's like you want to play some one shots. You want to play some modern stuff. You want to change the genre that you're playing in. You want to you want to just play like a short little finite campaign where you're like, oh, okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go on like a, a D and D campaign. We're gonna play levels one to three, whatever. Or oh, we're gonna play it until you've till you've bought the Bandit Lord to Justice, whatever. You can do that. There's so many different ways to to play the game that you don't have to just stick to one mode so you can sort of it, it almost like constantly reinvents itself and you can keep it fresh for yourself to avoid that sort of burnout that we were talking about where you get someone who's been like oh i've been i've been running like non-stop long running D, D campaigns for like 20 years and some people might love that other people might be like oh do you know i'm a bit i'm a bit ready to like try something else for a little bit just a bit of a change of pace and it's all available for you and, and and the beauty is now the systems out there which are, you know, we talk about the lazy D DM guide. There are actually systems out there that are are low prep, where you come to the table and at the table, the players and the GM, you know, invent the world and the story together. Well, and, beyond the walls, the classic example yeah. of that, isn't it? And, and and it really is with the play aids and you know the resources that they give you to enable you to do that. Really nicely thought out and designed. Not mat not. Not too much either. You notice when 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 the guy I forget who the, the the brains behind it is now, but they've they you can tell they've really considered that that they don't want that overwhelm going on. And, and when them when them books originally came out, they came out as a series of things, and they sort of started off. They did do that thing: start off in the village, mm. then they brought out rules that went a bit wider, and then rules that maybe I think they introduced some more different um expansion yeah. in, in terms of like i think races came along a little bit later magic uh got expanded i think another i think game changer for for the hobby was that the powered by the apocalypse games you know when you have the playbooks uh and i was listening to an interview the day with uh vincent and mcgay um uh, baker about you know how it you know how did they come up with this system which was completely different 
And McGee said, well, at the time, she said, we had a young family and a baby. We wanted a game and we didn't, I didn't have time to, to prep for you know, two or three hours for a game. We didn't have three, four hours game time. Uh, we had maybe a couple of hours. That was going to game fun before the kids woke up. So I needed something quick, short, snappy that I could just whap out, get on and, and play the game. And who, you know, they had no idea that it was going to be sort of a, you know, a big game changer. But for them, it was just, it was a solution to a problem that they had with gaming. Mm. And it's obviously lots of other people had the same sort of uh, the issues that maybe they haven't got time to spend two or three days in a week prepping for your Wednesday night game or whatever. Um, you, you get it on the table. And uh, I know it's, some people in, really enjoy the story uh, the storytelling side of it. Uh, you get others that are, and I know there's some players out there, uh, you're the GM, you you provide me the story and I'll, <laughs> I'll interact with it. Yeah, I, mean, but I to... don't know. I don't know how you play without creating a story because every time you you sit down in a session, things happen. You, you've ended up with a story, whether you want to call it that or not. That yeah. there's been a course of events. Yeah. There's a tale to be told of some description. I, I can't see how. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the, the way I've sort of distinguished it, and again, this is just based on like conversations I've seen and the sort of like role play like sphere, is. The, there seems to be a sort of a bit of a dichotomy between the the games that sort of set out to tell a particular story, whereas one of the things I, I'll often say about OSR games is like the story is just whatever happens during the session. Yeah, it's incidental. Yeah, it's so incidental. It's, so it's it? like playing an OSR game, you might be like, oh yeah, okay, you're in a you're in like a small town. There's like a wilderness. There's the caves of chaos off to the east or whatever. But you might not set out to tell a particular story from the get go. And there's some power by the apocalypse games that very much do that, like Scum and Villainy. It's like, right, we're gonna we're gonna tell stories about you guys pulling weird heists and sort of sci-fi like stuff like that. And that sets out to tell that very specific story. But mm. even in an OSR game where you're like you just say, right, here's the here's the hex map, go. And you let the players do stuff. When you mm. look back on it afterwards, you've still made a story. It's just you you didn't sort of set out to create a particular story. It was just it's, that's what some people prefer it because they say, oh, it occurs more naturally or more organically or whatever. But again, it's just what you prefer, really. And I think it goes back to where we came in to an extent. Where that, that whole idea of, for me, the whole ho- hobby is a little bit like sitting around in in a potential story circle, around a campfire, around a table, around whatever you sit around. And... It, for me, it is it is a sort of a story sharing or storytelling activity. How you go about it and all that, I, I'm not really too fussed. But you know, it, all of my role playing experience, and I think this is another thing that kind of keeps me coming back, is because you've got this rich history. You've been it's been doing it for so long. You've got all these sort of feelings of nostalgia and childhood memories to me they're all every game i've played is is a little story and a memory filed away in my brain and uh, you get fond of them and you just want to add more to them it's like a collection it's like the way we collect books and maybe we collect miniatures and we collect things as we go through life you you just want more of them stories and you just want the the next better one you know, you you want that next one that you can tell, and everybody's going like, "Oh man, that sounds, you know, that sounds awesome or whatever." Yes, yeah, the other thing it reminds me of, you know, if if you've uh, seen a film from years ago, say like for Star Wars, and then you'd be sitting in a pub, and so he said, "Do you remember that time when Luke's going down, going down the channel, and this is happening and that's happening?" Well, same with uh, stories from RPGs. Do you remember that time when you fell off the wall, the guards came over, and it's like a little, you almost make like a little. Um, video in your memory of it don't you mm, mm. yeah, yeah very that, much so. that time and it might be only that one little thing from a, a campaign it could be 20 30 years ago but it mm. never goes away like shifty mick getting married <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big mick <laughs> big mick yeah big mick uh, fat michael that's it but uh yeah and again uh, to come back to that idea of you know like chasing that impossible perfect system again it's with these sort of like character stories and like you were saying Colin you know you want to get more of those like cool stories and like memories and you want to create a better character and the next good character and stuff like that you're never going to get to one of the things I like about sort of role playing is you never get to a point where you're like do you know what 
I've a hundred percent mastered it. I'm done. So I think if I ever got to the point where I was like, do you know, I've a hundred percent mastered like GMing, I'd probably put my books down. <laughs> yeah. I'd like, probably put my books down. I'd be like, I'm done now. And, 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 I, and I'd, I'd cue the um, littlest hobo and, end theme music, and I'd like walk off into the distance. <laughs> but, and a, a, apart from acting, what other thing can you do? where you don't have to be the same person that looks at yourself in the mirror every day. If you want to be a swashbuckling hero, you can be it. If you want to be a thief and go out robbing everything, you can be that. You don't want to do it in your real life, but you can do it in your fantasy life, can't you? Yeah, I mean, as we said earlier, it's a, it's a great release from the the stress of everyday life. And you mentioned like the pandemic earlier, Pete. I mean, how, how much were, were people like gagging for, for a distraction from like the, the real world, like BS that was going on? at the time just say so we, we're constantly getting bombarded with like horrible news you know and obviously we're not saying like ignoring it because obviously you know it's important to keep abreast of what's going on but you know just for like a few moments we're like oh can i just set that aside for a minute just just relax and like do something else do something enjoyable i mean we I, saw I, like the 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 vast sort of how many more vtts came out during that time how how many more sort of games were being released and how many people were getting into gaming because people were just like crying out for something that that wasn't horrible to distract them from what was going on i mean, I mean in the past it, online gaming was a necessity for a lot of people because they they couldn't game with people that uh in their locality uh that they, that they wanted to the pandemic came along and it forced a lot of people to go online to interact with the people locally. But what I found, and I know others have found it, that although the in-person has gone back uh, into being in some cases, also the online has stayed as well because they've enjoyed it that much. They've got best of both worlds now. Mm. Well, they've discovered, totally discovered a new hobby and just enjoyed it and carried yeah. on kind of thing. Yeah, and, it, and it's mm. that thing I was talking about earlier where it's always good to have more options available to you and more choice because th there's no one sort of like standing over you like wrapping your knuckles saying, oh, you've got to play in person, you've got to play online. But no. as we said earlier, you've now got more options than ever before. That There's less of an impediment to like get into the gaming hobby if you want to because pretty much everyone's got an internet connection now. There's gaming's never been more popular. There's all these different resources. How many available. emails do you get about new Kickstarters all the time? It's like, oh, no, mate. no, no more. <laughs> if, if I bought every game I wanted to nowadays, I think I'd, 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 it'd be worth the electricity bill on the skins. Yeah. 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 I, th I, think, I, think the, I think the trouble is, when you get so many options and you get this uh, this thing cropped up recently, this idea of the long tail, yeah. where content is, you've got a certain amount right at the front end that's making the money, but then there's this almost infinite tailing off of attention or or whatever um, whatever you're measuring. Uh, this, the, the problem there is you things can get a little bit messy where people are trying, they're vying for the attention and we're in an attention economy. Yeah. And I, th I think that's, that's where we're getting some of this, um, some of the more the negative side, the more off putting side, because to get attention, there's nothing like stirring up a, a, a bit of controversy. Yeah. Like if, if you're controversial uh, or you, you're going to present a polarizing opinion, you're gonna you're gonna get more attention than than someone that's just kind of being chill about something, or you're kind of like in the middle of the road. You're not you're not extreme one way or the other, and that's I don't know what the answer to that is. That's a bit of a shame because I'd like I'd like to not have to trawl through loads of um, sensational kind of YouTubey stuff mm. to to get to. Uh, the buried treasure because, because yeah. um that the platforms are push they push that stuff as well because it goes oh, yeah. well that stuff gets pushed in front yeah. of you it's, it's just the worst it's, game ever or is this the best game ever sells better than yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. who who cares yeah. who cares yeah loads of people that's the thing they want to see this versus this this versus that i know i've done it i've done that no, click see, titles. yeah i've done it to see how it works and it's it's interesting but now, like with the podcast, I mean, I've, I've been I've been podcasting for years now, nearly done five hundred episodes, uh, and the, my my audience has not took off. It's, I've not really got any traction at all. It's it's pretty much almost 
people come, people go, and it's yeah. just around about the same as it always was because I just want to come on there and, and have a bit of a relaxed chat about something yeah, that, I I think, wanna, that I want to talk if, about. If you're going to do a podcast and think you're going to be the next critical role or, or whatever, I think you've got a bit of a rude, rude awakening, haven't you? Yeah, unless, unless you're going to be controversial and upset people and and that's going to lead to uh, publicity. Because like they say, no publicity is bad publicity and someone slagging you off is going to is mm. going to get you noticed just as much as somebody singing your praises. But but if um, you know if you just got this band of like a handful of listeners, and you know n- nobody's sort of like going out of their way to like review you or promote you or you or you're not pushing yourself into people's faces, you you're just going to be lost in this crowd, which is not necessarily a problem. And I I think it's less less of a pro- problem as a content creator as as it goes as it's i find it more frustrating as someone who wants to find stuff yeah that can be really difficult you know especially or, or, or the other thing i find is you find a podcast or a youtube channel or something that really grabs you and then it stops that they, they get fed up or anything oh no yeah because maybe they got into it because they thought it was gonna get they're gonna take off and be famous i mean so many of them maybe what do maybe five episodes mm. they come they're really keen at the beginning and then it it just tails off and i mean that's fair i can understand that people do it they perhaps don't realize what's involved um and, and it and it just goes away like life comes a Life comes along, but really, it it doesn't. It doesn't take that much to record. The, the, the hardest thing I find is, is uh, like you, is, is finding good new content. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I fail at that frequently. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, 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 sometimes. <laughs> so I just chat. I just say what I'm. I just say what I'm up to. It's just like a uh, journal kind of thing. Uh, sometimes you, you, you listen to a podcast and and it suddenly gets mentioned. And you think, oh, what? and you, and then you'll you'll find something else different content by accident which is gold you think why doesn't anybody else know about it but mm. yeah you you could you could spend ages coming up with and people do you know they, oh yeah people they put a lot of time into it they they find some really interesting idea and in that um but if you've got uh you know if you're if you're getting like you know around about 100 listens or something um i don't even know if i, I I'm lucky to get that nowadays on an episode. Um, and you're getting that regardless of what you what yeah. you do. Um, why why are you constantly trying to change it up? And mm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as, as you were saying, it depends what the reason that you're uh, you're doing it for in the first place is. I mean, like I say, if I if I get if I get hundred listens on a podcast episode. I think that's a, a result as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, same here. Yeah. But, but but to be fair, if I I've done some episodes where I've got like ten, twenty, but you know if it's just an episode where it's like ten, fifteen minutes of me just like chatting about something that's caught my attention this week, and I've recorded it purely because I enjoyed recording it, then it, it doesn't really matter. So I'm not yeah, I'm not expecting to be the next like Matt Colville or anything like that, you know. No, that's uh, I just have a look at mine. Yeah, sort of. And it's in sort of 50 to 100 call-ins, uh, 50, 50 to 100 listens is good. That's just get Jason the, with the call-ins. Yeah. Get, get, uh, get the odd one, you know, you think it's two or 300, but that's, when you look at the title, you think, ah, oh, yeah, because it's the title of that. But, yeah, mm. I say, but I don't do it for the, uh, for, for, for doing it for the uh, the listens that I would have given it a long time ago. <laughs> I, I think as long as you're you're happy with it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's another thing that, and I mention it because it is another thing that keeps me mm. into the hobby because you kind of like, you've got a little, there's a, especially with the anchor cast, you've got like a little community around that, like that are talking over, you've got an ongoing conversation. And like I, I'll nip on Discord and, and someone will, will say something uh, and I think, oh, I'm not sure I agree with that. And, Rather than discussing it on Discord nowadays, uh, I don't find that super productive. 
because it sounds like you're trying to convince it sometimes comes across as you're trying to convince someone about something and i think maybe the better place to discuss it is just do your episode sort of say well i was thinking about this there was somebody said this and it got me thinking and then just turn that into a podcast and then you i feel you can have a you can get your message across a little bit better and you can get some call-ins and before you know it um you've used something like discord it's created a little spark and then you've nurtured it and you've turned it into something a bit more and there is there was one from uh, Rayo just the other day. He, I forget what the subject. He did something a subject of one of his podcasts, and then about two episodes later, he said, "Oh, nobody's called in about it, so obviously there's no interest. So what are talking about it again?" <laughs> yeah, because he he done, he's done that recently. He sort of, sort of like said he'd throw in a few ideas into yeah. each episode and see, see what, what sticks. Hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a pretty decent idea, really. Yeah. Um, but I don't know that that means nobody's interested just because they haven't called in mm, yeah. because it can happen like some weeks later, you just get a call out of the blue and you find that someone's sort of listened and they've like been mulling it over. Or how many times do you listen? Then you forget what you was going to say. Yeah, yeah. And then the next episode comes in, someone calls in and then you think, Oh yeah, that's what I was going to Especially if call. you're listening on the move or you're doing something else. You're yeah. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, you can't. I'm, I'm, and then, yeah. It goes out. Yeah. Mind, and it's it? gone. And, and you get people that, they call in as soon as they hear it because you know they're, they're, yeah, they're yeah. sort of concerned that they're going to forget. And I've yeah. done it myself. And then, of course, <laughs> five minutes later, it comes up and he's disgusted. <laughs> and you think, oh, damn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I've been caught like that no end of times. I do think one of the nice things about the, the, sort of like the YouTubing and podcasting, though, is like, mm. obviously we've, we've all been doing it for like a fair old while. Mm. It's quite often, even now, like I'll get... I'll get some random comment on, well, I had one a few days ago. It was on a, a game I reviewed. It must be like four or five years ago. Mm. And obviously someone had watched that video and like mm. asked me a question about it. They're like, oh, is this like a rules heavy game or like a rules light game? So, and I was like, I've got to be honest with you. This isn't going to be that. an exact example because it's like five <laughs> years ago, but I don't remember it being very rules heavy. But yeah, it's nice to know that even with like, the sort of like past stuff you've done, you know, like people are still getting something out of it. Yeah, I put yeah. the data because I did a few uh, foundry videos two, nearly two years ago now um, on how to to run a game if there isn't a system built into foundry. And I had a couple of questions about, oh, I've tried this, I followed your instructions, and it doesn't work. So I had a look at it. Well, yeah, foundry's changed in the two years. So I'm thinking now, well, I just did one this morning. Uh, I'm going to have to re look up the episodes, do re record it, and go through it again and, and put some new content out. But mm. uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's surprising that you know, people, as you say, John, people still look at stuff that you did years ago, and you've it's, it's back there, isn't it? You, I mean, you've done it, and you've you've moved on. I think, I think some of the, some of those topics are evergreen, aren't they? Some yes, of them they topics are, yeah. are evergreen topics, and it's good it's good to see they still get like, visited. Uh, uh, like throwing oil, you mean? Yeah. See <laughs> now, you can expect to see that. How, how long did that soon. go on for? <laughs> still... And it's not gone. The gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> So. Yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know we were saying about um, various different options and sort of uh, the plethora of options that yeah. are available in RPGs. I think as well in terms of podcasting, there's various different options in terms of what you want to do for that. So if you want to just go on Anchor, quickly record like ten, fifteen minutes or whatever on your phone of you going like, "Oh, I did this today in my game and whatever," you can do that. If you want to sit down and go, like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make like a, a two-hour YouTube video, and I'm gonna have different camera angles, and I'm gonna record like me looking at a book and do this. You mm. can also do that, and I try and sort of do a bit of a mixture of both. But if I'm gonna mm. do one of these like long, well, like I was doing the um, the sort of card layouts for like the world, the random wilderness mm. generators and stuff like that, and the point core generators recently, it has to be something I'm really interested in doing yeah. because. If you start saying, oh, I'm going to record like multiple segments, I'm going to edit them together, I'm going to put annotations in and stuff like that, it can it can take you days to sort that out. So like, I'm not going to do that for every episode, because if it's just like me wanting to go over a quick five minutes and go, well, I'll tell you what, I've been thinking about like throwing oil in like, D&D. I, I don't, I'm not going to spend like six hours like recording and editing a YouTube video for that. But if something really does like grab hold of your attention and you want to put that time into it, you've got that there as an option as well i think you tend to find your niche don't you like mm. for me uh 
I, I like doing reviews. I, I used to do written reviews uh, in magazines and what have you. So I tried uh, different uh, podcast episodes and oh, the content may have been okay, but for me, it was just wasn't hitting the mark. But when it came to doing reviews, I enjoyed doing that much more. So that's where I, I've stuck at. Uh, it might not be, get me the best hits, but if I'm enjoying it, then that that's that floats my boat. I I I much the same. I did I did the reviews, um, and I I thought that was alright. I quite liked the one I did of Eldridge Tales. That was I thought one of my better ones. Um, but I remember doing it. It took ages. It took me ages, uh, and by the end of it. I felt like I didn't want to do another one in the in the very near future, uh, and and that one wasn't too bad. But I remember I recorded it in the car, and it was super hot, and it was just a bit grueling. I was doing retakes and oh, yeah. stuff like that, and then I put it all through editing, and uh, well, I think I released review, it. Worst for the review is you get halfway through the, you're doing your review, and you suddenly realise, oh. I've bollocks and stuff completely stop start again yeah and, and stuff like that and then i did another one for um a zine oh, i can't remember what zine it was now uh um i think it was a canadian guy but uh that was that was super grueling i couldn't get this bit right and you know you recorded it and you listen back and your voice was just like a bit kind of a bit flat didn't have any sort of sparkle or anything to it It just sort of sounded see i've done readings and they seemed all right when i recorded them they seemed fine and then when i listened back i thought that is as dull as you know all get out and i can't release that Mm. and just i've got so much stuff on the cutting room floor over the time i've been doing this that i just have not put out because i can't bring myself to do it and I, I and I think a lot of it's because you've been or or I've been trying too hard, and we're back to that mm. almost. It's like a job situation, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, or you're run or you're doing something you're not totally happy with, and it just comes across. It uh, just so comes we, across. We all get to the stage, and so I came across it uh, was, do I really want to continue with this? Shall I? So I just stop, and, and yeah. I think we all come to that. Yeah. That, that and some people do stop and walk away and you never know, touch them again or, or life changes but you know if you're, if you're going to do a podcast or you're going to do a youtube channel you've got to do it for firstly for you haven't you yeah uh, definitely. If you're doing it for someone else then it's it, it i don't think it works a lot less you're earning mega bucks and yeah i'm, I'm interested in many mega bucks by, by the efforts in. I, i'll tell you the other thing um seth goldie uh, no seth godin a writer, I read quite a bit of his stuff, and he's, he's I mention it all the time, the Akimbo podcast, he, because I think he talks a lot of sense. He, he talks about, you know, things, you get ups and downs in things, and he always says, ne- never drop out of something when you're in a dip. Drop never drop. Top. Yeah, because quite often that dip won't last, and and, then, and it'll pick up again, yeah. and you don't know where it's going to go. So don't, don't really drop out in a dip. Um and I've I've had I've had the dips and ridden them out, and and then suddenly something happens and you get up and it gets a little bit of momentum again because it's easy to think that it's something you've done, but when you've not got a very big audience, it it kind of um is it only takes sort of um pe you know especially to say I think currently sixty three percent of my listenership is it sixty three I think it is or is it eighty three. No, it's six, 63, I think it is, uh, are American. Yeah. Well, it only, it only takes a bit of something going on maybe in American politics and everybody is a little bit deflated uh, and, and they just don't, they're not feeling it. And that you can see that straight away yeah. in your listening figures uh, or there's something going on at a weekend or like a holiday that goes on for several days uh, and, and everybody's doing something family-wise and you think, oh, well, that was a bit of a rubbishy episode. And then lo and behold, then all of a sudden there's some kind of weird spike where yeah. every everybody suddenly like listen to something, mm. and you thought it, you know, so you can't, you got to be very care, be careful about what it's, you attribute to it, what. It's like you say, isn't it? It's the again coming back to that finding the fun thing. If you're, yeah. if the fun for you is making it, then like a podcast, a YouTube video, whatever it is, then 
you'll keep doing it because you're entertaining yourself. And, and I've mm. always said, like, when I do my uh, when I do my streamed games, like the Smoke and Snow stuff, and I've said a number of times, like, I mainly stream them, so I've got them as a record. If other people like watching them, that's great. But I mainly stream them, so I've got them as a record because I find them useful. So mm. I'm not if no one watches like the latest episode or game I've put, that, that's fine. You know, the, the thing is, I think. I think the thing is the listener numbers and they, they the companies that do this they're not silly they know that it's a convenient metric for you mm. to kind of evaluate and analyze your project but but that's a mistake because what you what you're doing is you're thinking oh people have watched that or listened to that I've got more listeners therefore that was a better episode yeah well that's that's there may be no correlation at all but because it's an easy metric you kind of you, you kind of you tell yourself that you think oh more listeners i must be doing better or i'm doing something better or i need to do more of that content yeah i need to do more of that and that that's got to be a, if you think about it rationally that's got to be a mistake you yeah. you know the way to figure out if your podcast is better is to go back and listen to episode three and if it sounds like a sack of rubbish then you've got better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but you don't do that. You sort of like, you're like, look at you. Maybe you look at numbers and think, Oh, more people are listening just because there's a graph there. You look at it. It seems like, I mean, I just we, looked we, at my, I've just looked we, at my stats now and that must be the first time in 10, 12 months. I've, I've looked at my stats. Cause I just don't bother with them at all. Yeah. But it's a neat, you can see how people do and they judge yeah. their worth. It's like, uh, what is it? What is it? What they say? Um, I know what you're trying to say about yeah. yeah. What do you call that? It's almost uh, like a popularity, you know, how how popular you are, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, oh, you're, the, you're validating the yourself, aren't you? Yeah, validation. So you're looking for like this val- validation to to make you. So the work you're putting in, it validates the work you're doing. But we we've all already said that we do it because we enjoy it. So it, yeah. it's a bit of a nonsense, but the 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 the, the, the platform is is. Um, taking advantage of your your kind of instincts to want to so, see something. So let's face it, Anchor isn't going to uh, boost any of our, um, our our podcasts and spend money on them because with our listenership, it's not worth it. But equally, YouTube, Critical Role, yeah, we're going to push out every advert going, Critical Role, because they've already got a million views, two million views, well, I don't know what they've got, but it earns them more revenue. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, you're saying that some people do a podcast and then they walk away from it at a certain point you've you've got to like find that enjoyment for yourself mm. or you've just got to set it aside i mean an example for myself is i used to do a lot of um a lot more than i do now uh, rpg reviews and i would literally like script those out i would spend mm. like a day recording them i would probably spend like another two three days editing them uploading them all of that sort of malarkey and he just got to say, I was like, oh, this is just a, a slog mm. and I'm like really not enjoying it. And I got to the point where I was like, right, well, I can either just like stop doing reviews or I can try and find a way of doing it that's more enjoyable. So like mm. my reviews now, they're more sort of like, you know, like a casual sort of like flip through a PDF and like talking about what I liked about it and what I didn't. A little bit less scripted. They're a little bit shorter. The, the, the editing's probably not as good but I'm getting more enjoyment and more fun out of doing them because I think if I'd have stuck with what I was doing on my YouTube channel, I probably still wouldn't be doing videos on it. Yeah. yeah. You just mentioned something that made me think the other day. I, I'm talking about the long tail. Uh, <laughs> it cracked me up. How many clones of Ben Milton there are now? Oh, yeah, just, the just, they just put the book there and just go page by page through yeah. the book with their own commentary. And they've probably got interesting things to say, but as soon as I see them, I think, really, yeah. really, yeah, couldn't, um, you have, couldn't you have just thrown he, it, changed it up a little you bit? You know, um, Bud, the, the, the scouser that <laughs> yeah. does it. He was, the first, he was like the first yeah. well, proper um, clone. Ben, ben had him on his show. He was, he was chatting to him, which I thought was really bizarre. <laughs> it's, so, it's so funny, and... And you know, you know they've got like, oh yeah, he's got he's got loads of views. If I do it like that, I'll get loads of views. And maybe they like it. And maybe they've got something to say. And fair play, you know, it is a format that works. And there's yeah. that whole keep it simple, stupid kind of idea. Well, why change it up? Yeah. But I per, I personally couldn't do it. I'd have to I'd have to bring something to the table, 
you know, something a little bit different. <laughs> it's have even got like a wooden table and everything. Yeah, same wooden table, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So funny. It is, um, it is easier, though, to do a review if, like, like John says, you know, I do it now. I get the PDF open and then yeah. I'll just flip through the pages and... Okay, well, it's super. Day. It's super efficient, isn't yeah. it? I mean, it's a and, really good way and to I do, do it. I do cut bits out and uh, I listen back to it now. That that's irrelevant. Just cut that bit out. But it's an easy way to doing it without scripting it because it's there in front of you. You can actually look at it as, as you're going through yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I used to script and spend ages doing it. Yeah, I'll say some of the ones I used to. Do, I used to spend probably as long, if not more, sort of writing the original script, and then I'd so I'd basically I'd, I'd obviously read through the entire book, making my notes as mm-hmm. I went along. Writing my mm-hmm. script, then I'd go through the script again, make like tighten it all up and whatever. Then mm-hmm. you've got to film it, and while you're filming it, as you were saying, Pete, you find bits like, oh, this does, this sounds good on paper, but it doesn't really work in the video. I'll get yeah. that. Out. And then before you know it, like a day, two days have gone, and you know, oh, easy. I, you know, oh, well, I've literally at the end of it, I've probably got like <laughs> an hour video to show. Let me say, which you're like, oh, okay, yeah, fine, I'm not really doing it for the views, but. Have I had more fun because I spent like my entire weekend doing this yeah. than yeah. than if I'd have just yeah. like bo- boshed out the the review in like half an hour? And okay, it probably wouldn't have looked as polished, but mm-hmm. I'd have probably enjoyed it more, mm-hmm. and I've had more fun filming it. And you know, I'd I'd have probably like I, I found now that I'm sort of doing the the shorter reviews, I'm more willing to go like, oh maybe I'll try like doing this like transition effect, or I'll try something a little bit different here mm-hmm. and there just as an experiment whereas when i was just sort of slogging through review after review you get to the end of it i I, I don't want to try anything different i just want to i've already spent three days and i just want to get it done get it wrapped and get it uploaded to but it's it's it's, you know it's like doing the will building for your campaign how much of that will building is not for your place it's because you're enjoying designing the system designing the races designing the politics you think oh yeah i'm enjoying this and 90% 90% of the time, your players aren't going to find out a fraction of what you're you're doing, but it's the, the enjoyment of, of that crafting of your own world, isn't it? It's a whole different aspect of the hobby, for sure. And yeah, it gets called the lonely fun. And people do it with their characters as well, don't they? Yeah. they they'll spend a lot of time on a character and then get killed in the first 30 minutes yeah. and, and not care. They don't care because yeah. they had their fun. Yeah. You know, that was it. They didn't spend all that time on it because they wanted a character like, that was um, going to live forever. The character just creation the Traveller. Some people enjoyed the character creation and, and never went on to play the game because they just enjoyed the character creation so much in getting a really obscure character, making some design choices. And, and that was the game for them. Let's yeah. just design characters. Yeah. Okay, guys, well, we've been chatting about finding the fun for about two hours. Has anyone got anything else they want to bring up? Yeah, this no, was no I, was, this I was, was. This was no fun at all for myself. <laughs> 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 I was going to sort of say about burnout, but that's probably you could potentially talk about that as a subject in its own right. Well, maybe, maybe we'll look at that for a future episode. There's a pen in it, as someone used to say on an old yeah, podcast. Yeah, put, put a pin in it. And there was another. There was another. There was something else that came up, um, and I can't think what it was because I never put a pin in it. You see, oh, I, should right. have, I should have put a pin in it. Um, but we were talking about something, and I thought, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and then now it's gone out of my head. So it'll it'll come back. It'll come back. You'll, 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 you'll find that fun. That's it. I'll find that fun. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure as always. I'm going to cue us out with the the outro music and then we will wrap up the stream so thanks for anyone who's watching this and now in the future from pete colin and myself great fun as always guys and hopefully we'll yeah. see you again in the future so long, so long.